All right, here we go. The mighty return of 1090 Jake. Welcome back to Vlad TV. Appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, man. Appreciate you coming back. You always do big numbers. You know, a lot of people give you a lot of love and a lot of hate, just like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it's time to kick up some dust again. Let's do it. Well, I had done a couple posts on, you know, the Vlad TV YouTube community. And I said that I got an interview coming up with 1090 Jake, and what questions should I ask him? And all down the comments was Lil Boom, Lil Boom, Lil Boom, Lil Boom, Lil Boom. So break down the whole Lil Boom situation. All right, so Lil Boom is a rapper, unfortunately, from Florida. And um, I had no idea who he was until I saw him on Adam 22 story. He reposted a Facebook post by the Ocala Police Department saying, we're looking for this suspect. There was three pictures. And it was saying that he was wanted for inappropriately touching minors in a Walmart. He comments under the post, this is Cap. If this was true, I'd be on a registry. So in two seconds, I do my little, I find the case. I read the arrest report. I see the outcome of the case. So I, I reply to his comment. You sure about that? And, you know, he cockily went live and said this and that. And, oh, you know, no, this didn't happen. And there's no video of this. And there's no proof of this. And slowly but surely, all of these things have been released. They released surveillance video of him touching a 10-year-old girl, a 17-year-old girl, another woman. So basically, his argument is that he isn't a predator, sex offender, whatever. But the charges that he got hit with, he got hit with a battery on a 10-year-old and a 17-year-old. The arrest report says he touched or grabbed their butt. And this blew up because apparently this is a close associate of DJ Academics. And um, I just so happened to cover the case in the video. So what exactly was he doing, though? Was it part of a skit or a video? Or was he just, I don't know, wilding out in a Walmart? Like, I don't understand the premise of the whole thing. Um, It wasn't a skit. He was walking around in his pajamas, basically getting up close to women, female, not even women, just females, um, and touching them for whatever reason. I've heard, I don't know if it's confirmed, apparently he was on drugs. That's something that came out. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but he says he was just trying to push them out of the way. The paperwork says he walked up on the 10-year-old, touched her, then touched the 17-year-old sister, followed them, did it again on camera, goes to another section, touches another woman, goes to another section, sees a woman bent over inside of the grocery store, pulls out his phone, starts taking pictures of her, and an older woman had to put a grocery cart in between him and the woman to stop him from taking pictures. So this is what's in his arrest report. He has whatever version he has. And then the surveillance videos started coming out. I mean, this sounds like drugs. This doesn't sound like something a sober person would do. Unless they're just weird. I don't know. I mean. Okay. So he's been arrested for this? He was arrested for it. Um, pled no contest and was found guilty. Sentenced to probation was told he can't have any contact, unsupervised contact with minors, no contact with the victims, and that he has to undergo a psychosexual evaluation. Okay, so when you plead no contest, that means that you're not fighting the charge. You're essentially admitting that you did it and you're not going to go through any court proceedings. It's essentially a plea deal in a way, right? Basically, no contest from what I understand is I'm not admitting guilt, but I'm not fighting the case. I, I understand the evidence y'all have. Um, and it's treated the same way as a guilty plea. You just get to walk away from the situation by saying, I never admitted to it. 
but they still found you guilty. Okay, so it's slightly different than a plea deal, but the outcome is essentially the same as a plea deal. Yeah, well, that, I believe the no contest is a plea deal because he still had a plea deal in which he had to sign off on, you know, the standards that they set for him as part of his plea. Okay, and he threatened to sue you over the allegations? Yeah, he threatened to sue me, No Jumper, and two other people in Academics Discord. Um, he says, I allege that he's on the registry or whatever, which I never did. He said, I said he pled guilty, which I never did. I broke down what no contest is. Um, he actually said that he was meeting with his lawyer today for a consultation. I don't know if this is true. I don't know if he's following through with it because obviously his whole argument has literally fell apart. Um, but if that's something he decides to pursue, we'll see what happens. All right. Everyone likes to throw this whole sue thing around, like they can download an app and sue someone through that. But the reality is that lawsuits, and I've been through them, and I've been on both sides of them, uh, usually take years. Uh, and there has to be a investment of at least, I mean, if you want to go all the way to court, you're looking at at least $100,000. Yeah. You have to be prepared to spend. Either you have to spend it or you have to find a lawyer that's willing to take the case on contingency for like, let's say, 30% of whatever the winnings are. And then that lawyer ultimately has to spend that money themselves, hoping that they'll get a bigger payday at the end that will cover their expenses. So lawyers will only take it on if they know that, okay, this person is almost assuredly going to win or there's going to be a settlement and the person they're suing has a bunch of legal money that we could somehow attach ourselves to. So for everyone throwing around lawsuits, it's just not as simple. Yeah, you could meet with a lawyer. You could pay to meet with a lawyer. Or you could maybe even meet with a lawyer for free. But in order, in order to pursue a real lawsuit is a big process. Yeah. I mean, and I think it was more so just like him trying to defend himself in the moment. What's the biggest thing I can do to deflect? And it's, oh, I'm going to sue. Well, everything yeah. you guys are saying is fake. I'm going to sue. But then more and more shit came out, and now it's at where it's at. Yeah, I mean, you can't sue someone for defamation when it's the truth, right? Yeah, you can't sue over someone saying the truth. We should make so, that a should make that a fucking t shirt. Making a t shirt, you can't <laughs> sue over the truth. Yeah, I mean, you could try. You anyone could sue anyone for anything. Yeah, that's just how America is set up. And if you can get a lawyer to take it on contingency, you will have to then get a lawyer to de defend yourself against that other lawyer. But ultimately, if what you're saying is the truth, then everything will stop. Yeah. Right? And depending on where you are, you might even be able to collect legal fees and, and so forth if you have to defend yourself over a frivolous lawsuit. So, uh, listen, I don't know. Uh, little boom. I just got wind of this recently, but... Like I said, when I posted that I got a 1090 Jake interview coming up and what should I ask him, this little boom name goes literally more so than any other name came up. That's crazy. And little boom was a rapper or a social media guy or? I, I don't know. I, I think he portrays to be a rapper, but he's really more like one of academics discord guys, which I don't really know what that is in itself, but. He's like an internet personality in the realm of academics. Got it. Well, shout out to academics, man. That's my friend. Yeah, big uh, shout out know, to him. He's, yeah, he's going through some things right now, but uh, this has nothing to do with academics for the record. No, academics and, that, and that's- In no that's, way tied into this particular situation. That's why I decided not to include him in the video that I did of Lil Boom to separate the two because a lot of people were trying to take- Lil Boom's allegations and not even allegations at this point, but what's going on with him and place it on academics, which I don't necessarily agree with. So Yeah, exactly. I think the biggest news that came out of you recently was you looking into the whole BG case. Yeah. Now, BG just got out of prison after doing, what was it, like nine years or something? I think it was like 11, 13, something oh. like that. Yeah, okay, yeah. So Did a little bit. Yeah, like 13 years. Um, he gets out, and, you know, hip-hop in general has embraced him 
pretty pretty well. I mean, Birdman was out there when he first got out. You know, me and Birdman had you know spoken about him a couple of times. Uh, Gucci Mane. Yeah, I did a whole project with him. Yeah. Uh, Mike Will made it, did some of the beats. Like, you know, it was kind of cool to hear BG back because I was a BG fan from from back in the day. Now, explain to me what exactly you found. So paperwork started to float around. And um, I looked into it. And what I was able to find was a piece of paper saying that BG and the third man in the case testified in front of a grand jury. When I found this information, I reached out to BG through Instagram. Uh, I tried to reach out to who I believe is his manager. I tried to reach out to Boosie. I reached out to you to try to get me in contact with Boosie. I was trying to get in contact with somebody from his camp to get a better understanding of what I found and come up with the best way to present this information. Now, this is the thing. I also spoke with the co-defendant who was accusing BG of snitching. Uh, Okay, so so before, before you go on, What's the backstory of the actual case? So it was a gun charge? Right. So basically, they all get pulled over in a the car. There's three of them in a the car. And uh, under BG's seat, they find a handgun. The guy in the back seat, I believe his name was Kentrell Washington, he tells the police it's mine. He claims it. Flat out claims it. Um, they take him to the police station. He has an interview with the ATF. He names a female and said, this female drove me the gun from Texas to New Orleans. That's how I got the gun. The gun is mine. And uh, basically, BG and the other guy, they say, yeah, it's his. He got it from the girl. This, that, and the third, whatever, whatever. Now, a couple months later, however much time had passed, BG caught a second case. And that second case... When BG bonded out of jail, one of his co-defendants and BG were making phone calls in which they were talking about having the other guy take the fall. They'll give him whatever they need to. They ended up bonding the guy out. The police were listening to the jail calls, so they understood that they formed a plan to have a man take the fall. That's why BG went to prison for that case. Going back to the first case. Okay, 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 hold on. So BG for, for went to prison for witness tampering or, or what? BG went to prison for, I believe, off the top of my head, it was the firearm and witness tampering because BG had a man sign an affidavit saying that the gun was his. The police figured it out. The charges stuck for BG. BG went to prison. But this isn't the case that he took the grand jury in. That case came before this. Okay, the case of the guy taking the gun charge. And you're saying that BG attended the grand jury confirming that the gun belonged to this guy? Can charge? Right, so essentially BG had two cases, same story. They get pulled over, guns in the car. In both cases, BG had a fall man. Kentrell was the fall man in the first case. There was another fall man in the second case. The police figured out the second case. Oh, BG's trying to get this guy to take the rap. The guy signed the affidavit. We're not going for it. BG, you're going to prison. But the first case, BG and the other guy went to court and testified in front of a federal grand jury. And all he did was repeat everything that the fall guy told the police. Now, in my mind, if you got a fall guy or if I have a fall guy and he says, hey, I'm going to take all this, da, 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 tell him it's mine. And the police say, yo, whose was it? He just told you this was the plan. What ended up happening was the fall guy was under the impression he was only going to get a certain amount of time. When he found out he was getting more than that, he turned on everybody else. That gun couldn't have been mine. 
It was under the driver's seat. The barrel was facing me. So now you're implying it must have been the drivers who stuffed it under the seat and the driver was BG. See what I'm saying? Okay, well, if you agree to take a charge, it's not like when you agree, you're agreeing with a prosecutor and you know exactly how much time you're getting. You know, you and your friends make a quick decision. Okay, look, I'll take the charge. You give me some money, whatever, to make up for it. You're the rapper. I'm just, you know, a regular working guy. I could, you know, I'd rather... I can sit down for a while and just take a check. Right. I'm going to have to take whatever comes with it. If it ends up being more time than I expected, that's my own fault for accepting to be the fall guy, right? And and this is where the thing comes into play. People are saying, well, if BG never testified any of that, this guy could have had a chance. And that's what that guy is saying. I didn't know BG was going to go to the grand jury. I didn't know he was going to say that because now I have no chance of getting out of the situation I'm in. So more or less, BG's fall guy basically turned on him. And now is alleging that, you know, BG snitched on him. Now, this is the thing. I spoke to this co-defendant. He tells me he has something that he hasn't dropped yet. So I'm thinking in my head, what does he have? There must be something out there that nobody's found. Because there was a piece of paper that WAC 100 put out saying that BG agreed to testify. So everyone was under the impression he hadn't testified, but he agreed to if it came down to it. So with this guy telling me there's something else out there, I went through PACER. I went through every single document. That's where I found, oh, no, he did. And in my mind, that's what I thought that this guy was about to drop. So that's everyone's like, why'd you drop the video on Christmas? I didn't really give a fuck about that. I'm looking at it like if I drop this first, this is what's going to sway the narrative. And in my mind, this was a fall guy. BG ain't saying nothing but exactly what this dude said. But what ended up happening was the second I made a video, I never once said in my video he snitched. But every single blog reported 1090 Jake says BG snitched. So it came out how it came out regardless. And the craziest part about it is everybody is saying to me, how did he snitch and he got a fall guy? You dumb motherfucker. I'm the one that told you he was the fall guy. Y'all ain't even paying attention. Nobody mentioned the fall guy until I put that in the air. But then they're going to tell, how you saying he snitched? I ain't never said it. So that's the crazy situation that transpired from covering the BG case. Right. So you're not saying BG's a snitch. I don't think he's snitched, bro. If you said exactly what the fall man said, how the fuck is that snitching? Now, I'll say this, though. They came out with an old clip of BG from back in the day saying, "If, if I catch a case with you and you don't take your charge... I'm going to make you take your charge. And that kind of went viral. Then they had another clip of Soldier Slim saying, if nobody takes it or whatever, give me 30 years. So it was two conflicting narratives that came out. Now, I was told by somebody associated with BG, he wanted to speak to me. I got on the phone with that person. That person called BG. But then that person said to BG, I don't know, I guess he wants to talk to you. So then I asked, does he want to talk to me? Because I ain't asked to speak to him. If he want to talk to me, we can talk on the phone. Because I already tried to get in contact before I dropped the video, but nobody wanted to pick up until after it came out. So me and him never spoke. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, listen. A lot of these snitching accusations become so gray area, like, okay, is snitching on a dead person still snitching? Is snitching on a fall guy who agreed to take the charge still snitching? I mean, this... If you're, if you're really just trying to be an absolute purist, then yeah, I get it. 
But if you take a step back and look at just common sense, if I agree to take the charge for you, whatever comes with it, I'm agreeing to it, right? And there's an understanding that there's a payment that you're going to make to me or some sort of favor is going to be done to me in exchange for taking this charge, potentially that was that you could potentially get hit with. So you're going to have to take whatever comes with it. As far as I'm concerned, if you didn't want to go potentially get in some jail time, don't agree to be the fall guy. Well, Everyone in the car could have been like, I don't that, know. I don't know who's going to this. That's the snake shit about the situation is if you agree to be the fall guy and I tell the police it was yours, you can later then say, oh, I never agreed to be the fall guy. Look at my paperwork. He snitched. And that's right. that's more or less what's come out about the situation. But Vlad, this is what fucked me up about it, right? Everybody jumped to BG's defense, not even knowing the situation. They're like, oh, he did 13 years. There's no way he told. Who does 13 years and they told? They don't even know really what the fuck they're talking about. But they all jumped to his defense. He comes out with a chain that says rat lives don't matter. But the first fucking feature he does is with finesse two times. And nobody said nothing about that. Nobody said nothing. So everyone was mad about, oh, the allegations and this and that. And motherfuckers are talking about it. But then y'all let him do a feature with finesse two times. What happened with his co-defendant that said that he snitched on him twice? I don't know how uh, that happened. Yeah, and in that same song with Finesse, Finesse two times, I guess uh, BG called Lil Wayne a bitch. I guess that took the spotlight over the situation, for, taken away from the fact that Finesse got, <laughs> got paperwork. So it's like, I honestly feel like there's no snitching in 2024, bro. That shit died in 2023. 2024, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Because there's been an excuse for every single person in every single situation. Somebody's picked and choosed. And there's not one rapper that I know that isn't somehow associated with somebody that said something. So it's like, how can snitching? It don't even matter. I don't even have a job anymore. I can't even expose people now. I gotta find, I'm about to start doing interviews like you because this shit that I'm doing is doing nothing for me now. It just, I, I did it too much. I overdid it. Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, you have Gunna who is on video admitting that YSL is a criminal organization and he has seen people do crimes and furtherance of the gang. And... For the first time, he had his own number one song, and I believe the song Fuck You Mean was the biggest streamed rap song of 2023. So if you want to say that snitching will end your career or any version of it, because, you know, you could say his gray area with him as well. Yeah. You got to throw that theory out the window because, look, he's doing better than ever. He's out in fat, you know, Paris Fashion Week right now with all the other celebrities living his best life. Yeah, I mean... um. I'm not even going to name all the people that are associated with who and, but it's just like, it, it doesn't stop the features, the shows, motherfuckers is headlining shows with people that have been exposed. It's just, I don't know, bro. I just, I, I don't feel like there's any snitching in 2024. I got to find some new shit to do. I hit a million subscribers. You know what I mean? Congrats. Appreciate Congrats. it. I, I ran my shit up, but now I got to find a new lane because this is dead. It's just, it's not there. Well, I mean, the answer though is obvious. And the reason is it doesn't matter because 99% of the audience doesn't give a shit about this and has no relation to these types of situations. 99% of the people who listen to hip hop either don't have a criminal record or if they do, they don't really have any sort of invested, you know, any, any sort of vested interest into a snitching kind of situation. Uh, at the end of the day, the legal system is sort of built on the foundation of snitching, yeah. right? If you take snitching out of the legal industry, very few people will ever get convicted of anything, right? 
It's crazy. You'd have to shut down courtrooms. You'd have to close prisons. Like the whole thing is based on cooperations and plea deals, right? No one really goes to court. What was it? 5% of cases actually go to court, maybe even less. Well, like the fair cases. Well, just no, in general, like if you look at all the criminal cases, what percentage of them actually go to court? Let's, let's take a look. What? You mean, you mean trial or just court? Trial. I'm not even sure. I know for the feds, it's low as fuck. Uh, okay. So, for example, in Los Angeles County, um, well, okay. Th- actually, I don't even have the answer because 15%, 85% are resolved by settlement or a plea bargain, and the remaining 15% are either dismissed or go to trial. So I'm sure, well, let's say half of them get dismissed. So you're looking at a single digit situation of people that actually go to trial. Yeah. So before then, there's cooperation, there's, you know, bargaining. And yeah, man, listen. And as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the way I was brought up and my value system, if me and you get caught doing a crime, I would definitely have to wrestle with myself, you know, and, and I, I would not want to go and tell on you so I can get less time. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I would feel, okay, I did it. I'm going to have to take a certain level of responsibility for my role in it. Now, if I get blamed for something you did and I had absolutely nothing to do with it, I would probably cooperate. You know what I'm saying? If I had not, you want me to do jail time over something you did that I had zero, you know, participation in, it's going to be pretty hard for me to go and do prison time over something I had nothing to do with. That's the but, streets, though. That's, that's the But code. that's the streets, right? In the streets, you have to go do that jail time for your homie, even though so you won't be labeled a snitch. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, like I said, it, it's it, it's a little beyond me, but I'm not also from a certain environment and so forth. Uh, at the end of the day, it seems like BG's going on with his career and it's not really affecting him all that much. At all. Yep. Well, just the other day, the O Block Six were found guilty in the murder of FBG Duck. This was a Fed case. And the six members are C. Murda, age 32, Kenny Mack, age 30, Los, 32, C. Thang, 24, Muwap, 24, and TZ, 34. You got to understand that they've been sitting in jail for like two years now. Yeah. So some of these guys that were arrested are like 22 years old, like barely able to drink. And now they're all facing mandatory life sentences. What is your take about this whole case? I mean, Chicago is one of the rawest examples of, I guess, modern day gangsters. Like that was an assassination in one of the most high end areas in Chicago, broad day, and he got hit, what, 20 something times? Um, they said it was a hundred thousand dollar hit. This is something that might be read about a hundred years from now. You know what I mean? This sounds like a, a fucking Al Capone hit, and it it just it is what it is. You know, I don't think the youth understand the meaning of a federal life sentence. I don't think they understand what type of life that is. And the chances of coming home are so slim. And the thing is, the, the, the gangster life that you're living, it doesn't end when you get locked up. When they get sentenced and they end up at them USPs, it doesn't stop. You still got to be gangster. And in the feds, you get caught with a knife, they give you more time. They give you additional years. So now you got life plus seven for a knife. You stab somebody, life plus 15 for the stabbing. They die. Now you're at ADX. Now you're in a cell with no window. You read your mail on the screen. The shower comes to your door. No human contact. Like, it gets bad. 
And I don't think people look at it like that. I think people, I think in this day and age, people look at it like a fucking sports team. You got the fans of Vaughn. You got the fans of Duck. People are talking about the score and we're talking about dead people. How many have been killed on this side? How many have been killed on that side? It's a game to a lot of people. This right here, this case is the end of a chapter in what is Drew. The feud between two of Chicago's biggest rappers is over. Dirk and Vaughn, and they're both gone. Two major losses on both sides and a huge loss for the culture itself. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine being a 24-year-old being told that the rest of my life is going to be in a jail cell with men and knives and <laughs> rapes and, and violence and you know gangs and so forth it, it it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me at all and, and when they say mandatory life what exactly does mandatory life mean that means that you have to do your life sentence or is there still some wiggle room to get out early uh mandatory life means you have to die you got to die. You might not. I don't even. Federally. They might not even let you off the fucking property. You might get buried in a federal graveyard because that's how they do it in some states. You got state. Wait, graveyards. wait, 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 wait. They will bury you in the prison. Yeah. <laughs> Is what you're saying? Yeah. They have prison graveyards where they don't have names on the slabs or nothing. You just get buried. So your family can't even visit your gravesite. Not as far as I mean, bro, a lot of people you got to understand you get a federal life sentence. What family is visiting you? D does every one of them have kids? Some of them might not even have kids. Their bloodline just ended with that life sentence. Yeah, there's nothing for you. I personally met people in prison whose whole goal was to get a CEO pregnant or a nurse pregnant because they understood when they die, their bloodline ends. And they just wanted to feel that they would continue on this earth. They don't know what comes after. They just wanted to leave something behind. And that's wow. something that they struggled with while inside of prison. There's kids in prison that ended up catching a body at 15, 16, and they're virgins. They've never had sex and they go to prison. And they got 20, 25 years, 30 years. I mean, when you got time like that, it's common for those kids to not care. Do something inside of prison that causes them to get more time and they never go home. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a disaster. And uh, the fact that it was done in broad daylight in front of the designer stores in Chicago. It was basically the Rodeo Drive of Chicago. Yeah. I mean, yeah, in the beginning, nobody was caught and everything else like that, but it, you know, law moves very slowly. Everyone has to, you know, the feds have to line up all their ducks and everything else like that. But in such a public place with all these witnesses, with triangulation of cell phones, with cameras everywhere, Okay, so you take the license plate off your car. They're going to follow that car to wherever it started. There's going to be cameras at some point of you driving that car somewhere. And they're going to connect the dots. And then in this case, they started pulling everyone's phone records. And they started to see the text messages of how the whole thing was set up. And yeah, okay, as a 22-year-old, $100,000 might seem like a lot of money at that time. What are you going to do with that when you're doing life? Well, that's also, how many people was it? Six of them? So that's 100K. Six to six people. That's yeah. 100K 100, split, split six, six ways. ways. Yeah. And like um, 15K, 16K a, a person? It's it's a mess, bro. It's a mess. It's unfortunate that it played out how it played out. But at the same time, people like Drew. And people like, people can deny it all they want and act like it isn't a part of it. Murder and drill go hand in hand. That's what it's talking about. This is the reality of it. A lot of people just don't envision that. Everybody thinks that they're going to be 
the dirk that makes it out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they don't envision the 20, 30 dead homies along the way. They don't envision themselves getting hit multiple times and bleeding out in the street while the cops are just looking at you. I interviewed FBG Duck twice. And in both interviews, we talked about all the violence that he endured, getting shot himself, getting stabbed, you know, his brother getting killed. And in both interviews, I said, yo, it's time for you to move out of Chicago. And both times he would argue with me and said why he's not gonna move out of Chicago and how it's safer for him in Chicago and he knows how to move and, and this, that, and the third. The first time you get shot, you stay in Chicago. Mm -hmm. The second time you get shot, you're still in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So you, you talk about how, you know, how much you value your life and how, how careful you are and how you know people want to hurt you. But yet, you're still in the same area where these shootings are happening. Like, nah, why, why see, not move? See, see, what it was, I went in the same area. It, like I said, you put yourself in somewhere you don't want to be, then you got to be ready for what's coming. You feel me? I was just in the wrong place. I wasn't supposed to be there. And I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. You feel me? But the second time I got shot, I, I was leaving the liquor store. You know, motherfucker followed me. I ain't see it coming. You feel me? Motherfucker got up on me. I'm just glad they ain't killed me. You feel me? Motherfucker shot me in the leg. Hey, went to the hospital, got it wrapped up, went to the party. Okay, but it's still Chicago both times, right? Yeah, it's still in Chicago both times. Okay, so so what I'm saying is, you see a lot of a lot of Chicago artists who just leave Chicago. You know, um, you know, you see you see Chief Keith. He live in Calabasas, around where I live. You don't you don't see Chief Keith back in Chicago anymore. I I don't remember the last time I've heard of Chief Keith in Chicago. Uh, you know, Dirk I think moved to Atlanta. Um, you know, was it King Yellow? I think moved to what was it Vegas or something like. You see, you know, Bibby and Herb, I don't think that they really stay in Chicago all that often anymore either. Like, mm -hmm. why, why stay in Chicago when these types of shootings are happening? See, what it is with me, like, I got more in Chicago probably than they got more in Chicago. Like, it's shit that I got to make sure I take care of here first before I do anything, like, you feel me, like, and plus, I ain't, I ain't the type of motherfucker that want to go move to another city, cause I don't, I don't trust nobody. You feel me? I don't trust new people. I don't want to hang around new people. I don't want no new friends, cause I don't trust nobody. Yeah, motherfucker could turn fake on you anywhere. You can die anywhere. You can get shot anywhere. You feel me? But it's just like in Chicago. I know better. You feel me? Like I know what to do and what don't to do and what not to do, you feel me? And it's like, now nah, how I move around, shit. I'm safe, you feel me? I ain't gonna say too much, but, you know what I'm saying? And you would think that, okay, I'm gonna be safe in front of the Fendi store, right? No one's gonna shoot me in front of the Fendi store, but yeah. this is basically what happened. And, you know, I, I don't like the fact that, you know, I was right in this case that he should have moved out. Like, you know, I, I like Duck. You know, we had multiple interviews. He's a cool dude. I interviewed his mom right afterwards. She was in tears over the whole situation. But, yo, like, to be in the city where there's so much death and you're dropping songs like Dead Bitches where you're making fun of the dead people of your enemies, you're building up a certain level of hatred where... I don't know, it gets to the point where people just don't care. Like, okay, I know I'm gonna get caught, but I hate this guy so much that I'm just gonna throw it all away. I'm gonna crash out. Yeah. And look, he's dead. Six people are essentially never gonna come outside again. All their families are crying right now and so forth. It's a, it's a mess. Yeah, it's sad. I mean, this, this goes on everywhere. It's just not on as big a scale with, you know, the famous rappers and stuff. This is going on all over the place. You got kids crashing out, trying to, trying to be like their favorite rapper. Everyone's just under the assumption that they're gonna be the one that makes it. Well, uh, Trenches News, uh, who has a YouTube channel, actually cooperated and took the stand in the trial, right? Yeah. 
So who is Trench's news? I guess he's somebody that's from Chicago that was around a whole lot of people. Some people are saying he's lying, but apparently he has a lot of insight on what's gone on from O Block to Duckside 63rd. And um, people were accusing him of being some type of informant. And then it publicly came out in the trial that he's cooperating. He's been cooperating. They said something about he took 20 grand for like a certain amount of years of cooperation. I think he denied those claims, but. And I mean, he's kind of like at this point, he's standing on it like, yeah, I did this. I did what was right. And <laughs> he's got a YouTube channel. He's still talking about everything in Chicago. Well, doesn't anyone know who he is? Because he wears like a Pooh Shiesty mask that actually covers his face. Yeah, so his name has come out. All of his mug shots have been released. They know who he is. He just, um, he decides to wear the mask. I think that's just like a staple at this point. Yeah, crazy. I mean, people accuse me of being the police, but I haven't done no shit like this ever in life. I've never, I've never cooperated. I've never taken the stand on somebody. Like, yo, I'm... This is not my thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's wild, but I mean, it, it also makes you question, you know, you got a lot of the older rappers that live that life and now have moved on and preach peace and this and that, but nobody ever praises somebody like him. You see what I'm saying? You go yeah. into another community, an Italian community, an Irish community, and, you know, in these certain communities... You'll have people that openly will tell and nobody cares. Like, yeah, that's normal. That ain't a gangster. But in hip hop, it's, it's frowned upon on all levels, but then people get mad when people die and kill each other. So I don't know. Well, yeah, the, uh, you know, the feds actually put out a statement after the guilty verdict. They said people have the right to go about their lives and walk the streets in safety, free from violence. The jury's verdicts today hold that six defendants accountable for a brutal murder that took the life of Carlton Weekly. Working with our law enforcement partners, our office will continue to prioritize co combating the unacceptable level of gang violence in Chicago. All too often, our residents are held hostage to violence to other dangerous activities on our city streets. These convictions show there are very real consequences for murder in the city of Chicago today, tomorrow, and every day going forward. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the feds, uh, feds did their job. Six people got convicted, life sentences. It's very public. It's, you know, being covered in all the different news outlets. I mean, th this whole thing is, you know, <sighs> I mean, I understand that it's not just based in music. I understand that there's loss of life, you know, with blame from both sides and everything else like that. But at the end of the day, you have to walk away from this shit without losing your own life or your own freedom for the rest of your life. Like that, that's not accomplishing anything. Okay, so so these six guys killed FBG Duck. Or are they getting a prize? No. You know, is there a big payday for it? Are they even getting the hundred thousand promise to them? Probably not. Most likely not. I think they all just got little chains and you know, you get the notoriety, I guess. I mean, some people look at it like, look. I might get smoked anyway, so at least go out with a bang and be remembered for something big. And people will look at it like they did some legendary shit. I mean, they got ducked in the craziest way they could have done it. It's going to get talked about for years, but eventually it's going to be forgotten. And that's when people, that's when reality hits. It's not going to hit in the next five years, 10 years, 20, 30 years down the line. That's what motherfuckers going to be really thinking of because we're going to forget about it by then. We're not going to. Me and you aren't going to be talking about it in 30 years. No. But those six people are going to be thinking about it. Yeah. Hit Duck's kids yeah. are going to be thinking about it. And I yeah. mean, the, the feds were so serious. They were stepping down on YouTubers about hmm. the situation because you had Seti Nash that actually went to the courthouse while everything was going down. They ended up pulling him into a room and questioning him. And they tried to say in one of his videos, he tried to say something along the lines of, are y'all going to handle that? Either talking about Trenches News or FBG Butter. And the feds were like, 
yeah, it, it's sounding to us like uh, you want somebody to cause harm to our witness. And Seti Nash made another video saying it was all just a joke and, you know, it wasn't serious. But the feds are literally pulling YouTubers out of the courtroom, pulling them aside and questioning them on their intent and the content that, that, that they're creating about the case. Well, didn't FBG Butter take the, uh, take the stand in this case? Yeah, he, he telling on everybody. Like, he done told on, like, half of Chicago. He's telling and catching gun cases while he's telling. Like, he's testifying and then doing interviews on how he's not a bitch for testifying and then catching a gun case and then bonding out and then doing another interview about it. Like, Butter, Butter's on another level. If there was an award for this shit, it's going to butter. Really? It's, yeah, butter's bad. And he still is staying in Chicago while all this is happening? Is this why the, the gun cases are popping up? I mean, the, from my understanding, yeah. Wow. See, that's, that, I, that, I just, that's the dangerous... I just don't understand why people stay. Like, 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 to me... They're broke. Man, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I will find a way. <laughs> Right, it's better than being dead or in jail. You know, like, if I knew that I had a murder that, you know, like, for example, the Keefe D case, yeah. right? Keefe D is sitting in jail right now. His house got raided. The word was out that there's a grand jury indictment over the case. He knows he wrote a book about it and did a bunch of interviews about it. They caught him in Vegas. They didn't have to go look for him. He was right there in that same city. If I was involved in Tupac's murder and they just raided my house and I still have my passport, I'm out. I'm out. I don't care how much or how little money I had. I will do whatever it takes to get out of the country, to go to some place that has no extradition, because I used to have a valid passport, I could travel around the world, and you're gonna have to try to get me out of Iran, or out of Russia, or whatever else, and that might be years in the making, and it might not even ever happen, because a lot of these countries don't cooperate. You know what I mean, when there's no extradition policy, I mean, it's one thing to have no extradition policy, because I actually looked this up recently, but there's another where there's certain countries that are actually purposely not going to cooperate with the U.S. Yeah. Because there's a, you know, adversarial stance between the two countries, right? You go to Iran, if you could make it into Iran, there's no way they're going to give you, allow the U.S. to come in and take you. Yeah. You, in Russia, if you end up like, like, you know, Edward Snowden, you know, after he got caught with all those, you know, the, the leaking of the files and everything, he went to Russia and that's the end of the story. Yeah. And he's doing interviews and, you know, yeah, I mean, he's probably not living the best life, but he's not in prison. So I, I don't I don't really know, man. But. Well, speaking of Keefe D. What's your take on that whole thing? I mean, I feel like he wanted to profit off of the situation because he never profited off of the situation. He was supposedly supposed to receive a certain amount of money. He never got the money. And um, he wanted to sell the story, and he sold himself into a murder case. Right. So he's in jail right now, and recently the judge gave him a $750,000 bail. Now, if he can come up with that, then he can get house arrest until the trial, which is middle of next year. Or no, actually middle of this year sometime. But from what I understand, he doesn't have that type of money. Is it is it the whole seven hundred and fifty or is it ten percent? I mean, it could be ten percent, but he don't you have, have to put up something? I mean, don't you have to have? They're not just going to give you ten percent. You got to put something as collateral as well, right? I'm not sure. I never. If I ever went to jail, I never got out. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they could give you the ten percent, but you know, like if he comes up with seventy five thousand, potentially you can get a bond, but the understanding is, is that if he ends up leaving the country, the, the bail bondsman is going to be on, you know, is going to have that 750000 that he's going to have to pay back to the courts. 
So they're not just going to give you $675,000 without some level of collateral. There's, there's usually a process with this. Unless you're like in such high standing and you have so many assets that they know they could whatever, he's going to have to either put up, someone's going to have to put up a house. He's going to rely on you. He's going to say, hey, Vlad, I'm going to do five interviews with you and only you. Five interviews. We're going to get this right. going. <laughs> right. Well, you know, you know what's funny is that actually before he got arrested, uh, he approached me to do another interview and asked for a deposit this time. Usually we just pay him after the fact, but he asked for a deposit. It wasn't that much money. And I knew what was going to happen. I'm like, okay, he's probably going to get arrested and I'm never going to see this money again. But whatever, whatever. We've done two interviews. The interviews have done well. Like, I don't really care. Um, but yeah, he asked me and a couple other uh, platforms and got some money from a bunch of different people, but it wasn't that much. Not enough to to go to Iran. You know what I mean? I mean, anything and, um, anything counts when you're locked up, so. Yeah, yeah, maybe that was just his commissary money that he was putting together. Uh, I don't know. Do you think that he'll be convicted? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. If he doesn't have the money for a raw legal team, most likely, uh, because that's really what matters. You know, and it's like everybody jumps on, oh, I want to, I want to bond out. I want to get a house arrest. I want to, you got to make sure that that lawyer is secured first because that's, I'd rather be in jail with a fire lawyer than be free with a public defender because that's really what's going to make the fucking difference. So if he doesn't have the right legal team, he's most likely fucked. Well, yeah, at one point he needed a, uh, a public defender like a court-appointed attorney, but then I believe he got his main lawyer back, which was like the original lawyer that was around when he first got arrested way back in the day. Um, I don't know. Uh, there was some some recent news that they were trying to say that uh, him and his son were threatening to kill a witness or something like that. They, they used the term green light. But from what I understand, th they're trying to twist their words around a little bit. You know, I think I think that they were talking about themselves having a green light as opposed to someone else. And, you know, they're trying to basically twist the slang around. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a rumor that he got beat up in jail. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But ultimately, you know, like me and Greg Cading, this is the guy that got the, the first confession from him. Right. You know, whatever, 15 years ago. What What we essentially both agreed on was that his entire case from top to bottom is going to rest on him saying that everything he said was for entertainment purposes only. And it was just a way to make some money or to get out of prison, which is originally he had a PCP charge. So he's basically saying that the whole thing is made up and, you know, it was just a way to make a few dollars by trolling on the internet. Now, if the jury buys that, he'll walk free. Yeah. If the jury doesn't buy it, then he's probably going to do the rest of his life in prison. Yeah, I, I don't think they're going to buy it, but that's just my opinion. You know what I'm saying? I'm not rooting for him either way, but it's just like he talked too much. He said way too much. So. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. Uh, I think by sometime in 2024, we'll probably figure it out one way or another. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, but at this point, he's like 61 years old. I mean, in a murder case, you're not going to plead out to like probation, no. you know, something, something this serious. He placed himself in the car. He was saying he handed the gun to Orlando. Like he basically made himself a participant in this crime. He didn't just say that, you know, yeah, I was driving. Suddenly someone pulled out a gun and started shooting. And I had no idea that this was going to happen. He, he put himself in the conspiracy of it all. And, yeah, it'll come down to a plea deal or a, or a jury verdict, one of the two. Yeah, I mean, at his age, like, the best outcome you can have for killing a motherfucker is, like, the best outcome is manslaughter, which usually is going to come with 10. If you get hit with a second-degree murder, 15 years is incredible. But at his age, it could be a death sentence. So it's like, yeah, he doesn't have the the life to spare. He doesn't have the years to throw away. Oh, yeah. All he had to do, because, you know, listen, Greg Kading, when he got the confession, 
it was secretly recorded. And when Greg re retired from the LAPD, he went to Keefe and said, I'm putting out the audio footage and I'm writing a book and doing a documentary. So it all came out. And yeah, he probably looked like a snitch to certain, you know, people in his community and so forth. But if he had just said, okay, fine, this is how you feel. I'm going to go on living my life. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. He would be out right now. Right. Hanging out in Vegas, living his life. No one would really know what he looks like because he's not doing interviews or putting his face out there. And he would just go about it, go to the grocery store and, like it never happened. But that pride, pride is the downfall of man. Yeah. So. Yep. Well, we're talking about Chicago and you would actually put out some information on King Yella. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So tell me exactly what happened. Well, King Yella, uh, you know, he likes to do interviews. Um, and he basically sat down with the police and gave them a whole fucking interview on all of his ops. And they asking him who's in what gang. And he's saying, oh, offsets a GD and 600 Breezy's a BD. Uh, Dirk's a BD. Snap dog, fuck with Dirk. This happened, this happened, this happened because of this happened. He just, um, he went in there and said everything. He was in there talking to the police like, like they was his fucking friends. And I ended up finding the paperwork. Well, what was he talking to the police for in the first place? Uh, it was a voluntary statement. Well, I mean, you don't just voluntarily walk into a police station and start talking. I mean... Well, was it, all right, did, he get, so, did he get arrested? Did he get arrested for something else or? Yeah. So he was parked in a handicap spot in Las Vegas. Okay. Um, that that's what set this off. And then they ended up finding a 380 on him that I think uh, had like okay. three bullets in it. Um so I was surprised by that because he's from Chicago. Like, that's home of the switches and thirties, and he got three bullets in his gun. Um and a lot of people actually ignored this, but they asked him where'd he get the gun, and he said, my girl bought it. She bought it from a gun store. And a lot of people said, you know, oh, no, nah, that ain't snitching when you put it on your, your girl. Yeah, if she's with you, she wasn't with him. It was just him. So you literally telling the police who supplied you with a fucking firearm. Now they take him to the station, and he gives a voluntary statement and they're asking him about all this other shit. What'll happen when Otis come to Las Vegas? Is he gonna press the issue? What happened with him and 600 Breezy inside of the mall? They're asking him about what gangs are in the area, what gangs he associates with, and who's basically in what. And, you know, his excuse for this was, everybody knows that. But see, this is the thing. When they're trying to prove somebody as a gang member in court, they get one or two people. They either get a gang expert, which is a detective, or they get somebody that's snitching, that's tapped in with the streets. So in this case, you're confirming who the fuck is in a gang and what gang they're in. And at the same time, this is King Yella, the one that dropped the song about rats, I forget what the title of the song was, but he dissed Gunner, he dissed Boston Richie, he dissed 6 9 he says he doesn't make any statements, he lets the lawyers talk for him, and you know, this is what came out. Well, okay, to be fair, I've interviewed Yellow before, I think once, a long time ago. Let's say, for example, 600 Breezy. He said that 600 Breezy is a black disciple. Mm -hmm. Well, in my interview, 600 Breezy talking about how he switched from GD to BD when he was when he was younger, and he's a he's a black disciple. I mean, you don't really need King Yella to say this when the actual person is, is saying it themselves. And I mean, I, I've never heard of the whole offset thing, but. Dirk and all them, they, they've mentioned their gang alliances through various songs and interviews and stuff like that, right? Well, Dirk has publicly denounced his gang affiliation. 
And that was one of the big things with the case that him and Vaughn had in Atlanta was him denouncing the affiliation. So at the end of the day, no matter what somebody says, if you as a gang member are confirming to police who is in what gang, what the fuck are you doing? Well, how is that helping you in that little bitch ass gun case you just caught? What is that doing for you? Why are you even talking about that with the police? And the reason so many people got on his ass is because how much he talks about everyone else in similar situations. So he went off on Gunner for everything that Gunner did and Gunner saying YSL is a gang. But when it came to him naming multiple gang members, confirming the status of what they are, he wanted to say, oh, I didn't snitch. I just said public knowledge. Well, he addressed it. He said, did anyone go to jail? What the fuck does that mean? I could call 1-800-TIPS right now and say some shit just because nobody got booked. That doesn't mean I didn't just snitch. The fuck does having someone going to jail have to do with it? That means you completed the mission. There's snitches that fail too. <laughs> so it's like, just because nobody went to jail, that doesn't make you fucking, you know what I mean? That has nothing to do with it. Yeah, well, you know, social media had a field day. They started calling him King Tella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the internet undefeated. They gonna come undefeated. up with some shit quick. Undefeated. Uh, listen, man, it's it's hard. Like, I don't, you know, you, you're, you're minding your business. You got this gun that you shouldn't have, that you don't own, that you're not registered with. You're rolling around Las Vegas. And Las Vegas is one of these places that they let so many things slide, from prostitution to gambling to you can legally have like 100 guns. When you do something outside of those very loose rules, they, they will come down hard on you. Yeah, and I mean, and not only that, but it's a major tourist attraction. Yeah. So for you to think you're going to move around and make a motherfucker uncomfortable, you fucking with everybody's money. They're going to get rid of you. They're going to get you out of that situation. And then not even that, but everybody he hanging out with in L.A. or in Las Vegas is a fucking rat. Skinny from the nine, his interrogation, Ben got posted when he snitched for shooting a flag gun at somebody's house. And then um, Crip Max fake dad, whatever his name is, I forget it. He testified in his federal case against multiple people, multiple people that are still serving time right now. So it's like, it ain't even just you that got bad paperwork. It's everybody that you with. So it makes well, sense well, yeah. that it makes sense that he's not, he's talking about the gunners and this and that, but you're not talking about the people that's in your own circle. Well, and also, when you look like King Yella and your whole face is tatted up, you are a police magnet. You are a magnet for law enforcement. You know, it's not like if I was, you know, if I was parked in a handicap, I doubt the police would search my car. Right? Let's just let's just call it for what it is. Uh, but if I had a bunch of face tattoos, they probably might search my car. Right? Yeah. That's just how life works. Is it fair? No. Because my face tattoos could be anything. It could be, you know, my artwork. It could be I'm a painter or... Maybe it's my religion, but at the end of the day, you get a bunch of face tats. And you have face tats. I mean, do you feel like the police mess with you more because you're face tat? Um, no. No? No. I've I've honestly, since I started YouTube, I've had like zero interactions with the police. I got pulled over once. I've only been pulled over one time in my life. My car didn't get searched or nothing. He, I literally told him this is the first time I've ever been pulled over because I got tense. I don't get fucked with like that. But then again, I'm not really doing anything. I'm not in those right. areas anymore. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's like, I don't know. Maybe it's just the, the energy you give off because when you got something on you, you're not supposed uh. to have, you, you, you kind of, you're a little sketchy. You know what I'm saying? You feel yeah. it. Because you know you ain't supposed to have that shit. 
And the police are trained to pick up on certain things. You know what I'm saying? But if you're going to be a dumb motherfucker and have a gun on you and park in a handicap spot, it's your own fucking fault. You can't carry shit you're not supposed to have and be speeding and your license is suspended. and You got to have all your shit together. Otherwise, any little thing you're going to get fucked with. But I, I have that's, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, now that you mention it, to have an illegal gun in your car and park in a handicap spot is insane. When you really take a step back and look at it, it's insane. Yeah. So now they're looking at you like, oh, no, it ain't that you're not artistic. You're fucking autistic. Like you're not even thinking out here. You just tatted your whole face because you're fucking. You know what I mean? Like it's just they're gonna look at you for what you are. Well, you made a video by a guy named Big Mike and some affiliation that he had with King Von. Yeah. So what exactly happened there? Big Mike was from Old Block, and um, he claims that a lot of what Von became was due to him, that he was like a, you know, not a brother, but a figure that Von looked up to. He was older than Von. A mentor? A mentor, yeah. A mentor in the streets, more or less. Mike has his own reputation. He's also the brother of Wooski, who Vaughn had a notorious beef with. And um, Big Mike caught the murder case with Vaughn. Vaughn's very first murder, allegedly. Uh, the case that he went to jail for when I think he was 19. And Big Mike snitched in the case. Vaughn would go on to talk about it in songs and on Instagram lives, and Mike just came home. Okay. And he cooperated in, in what way? Oh, he told every fucking thing. He told the whole story from A to B. Okay. So, I mean, it was down to the point that, hey, Vaughn called me for backup. We went to the party. We ran through the gangway. Vaughn opened fire. When I turned the corner, one dude was already dead. Vaughn kept chasing the other guy. Vaughn was saying, why are you running while shooting at the guy? Like, he gave up the whole story. And, I mean, he admitted to shooting a gun. He ended up getting time. Vaughn ended up beating the case. Mm. Crazy. Yeah. Well, rest in peace, King Vaughn, man. We were supposed to have an interview with him right before he passed. I would have loved to actually sit down with him. Yeah. That would have been one of the biggest interviews ever. Um, but, yeah, the, that whole situation was was definitely tragic. And to see it all unfold on video and you see all the surveillance footage and yeah. everything else like that, yeah, it was, it was a whole mess. Uh, speaking of King Vaughn, Quando uh, Rondo got arrested recently. Right. And you made a video about it. Uh, yeah, I've covered the Quando situation a little bit, and um, I've even spoken to him behind the scenes. And, I mean, basically the feds just doubled down on this case. He already had it as a state case, and then it just became federal. Okay, what is he being charged with exactly? I believe the fed case was just, like, selling weed. Now, the state case, they're trying to say that he's a leader of the Rolling 60s Crips. He's using communication devices to set up sales and this and that. Um, the Fed case didn't really mention the gang aspect, more so just the selling drugs. And there's some firearms involved in the situation, but for him, I think it was just solely drugs. Okay. I mean, Kwan Rondo has a project with NBA young boy uh he's got a real fan base uh, I remember Boosie talked about how Kwando was actually pulling up to his party and then suddenly the feds swooped in and arrested arrested him he said it was like a movie it was like crazy dude came out there and say Kwando finna come fuck with you Kwando on the way up here to you, fuck you with you you fuck with Kwando he's one of your movies yeah and, yeah, yeah I fuck with Kwando and uh man bro this shit was like a like a movie, bro. It's a couple of his, little, his partners pull up, like, Kondo finna pull up, woo the woo. We waiting on Kondo to pull up. They like, 
The police got Quando down the street, outside down the street. The feds taking him to jail. I was like, fuck. I was like, fuck. I ain't, I ain't even get to see it, man. I, <laughs> and when we didn't hear about it, when we got to the uh, the other spot to eat, we like, this motherfucker might have been lying. Next morning, I see it, bro. And in fact, I think uh, Quando a couple of years ago even said that he's throwing his flag down. He doesn't want any, anything to do with the rolling 60s. He's not gang affiliated, whatever else. I don't know if he knew something was coming down the line, but I don't know. Is this something that he's arrested for recently or is this from something years and years ago that they're trying to dig up and, and get him with? So as far as I can remember, it's recent. Um, within the last couple of years, with the gang situation, I think that was more so because of how things were playing out for him. I mean, one of his friends was killed in L.A., which is literally the home of where his gang come from. You know what I mean? So it's like he can be official where he's from in Georgia, but when you go to other states, other states play differently or they, they want you to pay homage or they want you to literally pay. And, you know, if you go out there and something happens to one of your people, you're most likely going to start looking at everybody a little differently. So I think he tried to separate himself for himself and for his career. But unfortunately, the affiliation is something now that the courts are pushing. So even if he isn't involved with them, in the court's eyes, he's a leader. Well, yeah. I mean, he claimed that he saw the paperwork and someone in a circle snitched. Yeah. Uh, which, which oftentimes, this is, this is what happens. Uh, you know, free AR app. People like to say that my interview somehow got him convicted. Uh, my interview had nothing to do with his conviction. Someone in his crew fully cooperated, cooperated on everything, became the star witness. And when you have someone in a situation like that and they prove that the, he was around and, and everything else like that, it's hard to get over shit like that, man. Uh, man, I mean, I've interviewed Quando Rondo before early on. Uh, I think he's a dope artist. Uh, yeah. In fact, I think that that project he did with NBA Youngboy is probably one of my favorite Youngboy projects, period. Thought it was great. And uh, to see this at this point, man, it's, yeah, man, it's sad. Yeah, I mean, that and then what happened with Vaughn, you know, obviously had a huge impact on his career. Um, and it chose a lot, it made a lot of people choose sides in that yeah. situation. And it's unfortunate that things play out like that, even with the fans. And, you know, at one point they were cool. Everything was cordial. So I'm sure he wishes none of that shit ever happened. And, um, you know, it's crazy how it played out. Yeah, I mean, it was a fist fight that turned into a murder. Well, turn into multiple murders, I believe. And, and multiple people getting shot. It was, it was a train wreck. Yeah, I mean, that and then... That and what came from that, because then it became, okay, Quando, what are you going to do? Are you going to stand on it? Are you going to try to play peacefully? Because even if he came out and said, yo, I don't want, you know what I'm saying? That would have took an effect on his career because people would have looked at him like he's not like that. He ends up standing on it. He's done some music videos, dissing people and had someone recreated to look like Dirk and it just became a real bad situation because he he had to essentially stand on what happened in a disrespectful manner to keep the image to preserve his career. Yeah, I mean, listen, if you look at, just take a step back, right? Take, it, take a look at all the top rappers right now. None of them are gangsters. Drake... J. Cole, Kendrick, none of these are gangster rappers. In fact, outside of Kendrick, too, well, okay, Dre grew up middle class. Yeah. J. Cole, you know, grew up in a, you know, in a lower class community, single mom and stuff like that, but never really claimed any sort of gangster type activity or never claimed to be a tough guy. Kendrick, same thing, grew up in Compton, around a lot of gangs, but never claimed any sort of gang banging himself. 
So if you look at all of the people that are making the hundreds of millions, none of them are trying to create this image for themselves. Not yeah. a single one. So if you really want to make the big money, you don't have to hold on to this image that's just hurting yourself in the process. Yeah. You know, your talent will rise above all that if you have the talent. Now, well, if you want to take the shortcut, you that's, know. That's the thing. If you have the talent, it's a lot easier if you have for the people talent. to become known through dissing and, yeah. you know what I'm saying, even criminal cases. Yeah. Well, uh, Honeycomb Brazy, he came home and then just got caught with another gun charge. Yeah. And from what I understand, I, I saw like a post. He basically said like fake ass security had a gun that I didn't know about or something like that. So, you know, he's out, you know, he's a felon that's out on bond or, or bail or probation or something. I forgot what it was. Um, well, he got out of prison. I think he was on parole or something. Mm -hmm. He was on something. But, you know, he signed to them boys out of Texas. They sent the security squad to him. Uh, they sent them a bulletproof Escalade and two guards, one of his security guards was a convicted felon, couldn't have guns at all. The other security guard was real security, but come to find out a few months prior, got a, uh, what's it called when a girl puts it on you when you can't go near her? Restraining order. Right. So she, she put a restraining order on him. Part of the stipulation was for the duration of the restraining order, he can't have guns. Wow. He never told anybody. So he's basically a convicted felon. So when they get pulled over in the car, you know, they smell weed, whatever, whatever. They take out the main security guy. They ask him, is there guns in the car? Because he gets out with a vest on. And he's like, yeah, there's a gun under my seat and there's a rifle in the back or an AI pistol in the back. When they search the vehicle, Honeycomb Brazy is sitting in the back with the other security guard, and then behind them is another row. That's where the AI pistol is lying. Because Honeycomb could have reached back and grabbed it, they hit him with a gun charge. Oh, so it's not even so much that someone else in the car had a gun. There was a third gun that was just lying there. No, that was the second gun. Oh, that was the second gun. Okay, so right. there's a second gun so the, that was just lying there. Okay. Yeah, the driver had his under his seat, and then there was an AI pistol in the back, and that's how they got brazy. And what's fucked up about it is no one else spoke up. Oh. No one claimed it. No one. So everybody goes down. Wait, so the security guards that were hired for him are not claiming a gun that they came with? Exactly. Wow. That's wild. But I mean, won't something like this come out in court? Like, listen, these are security guards. They came with a gun. I'm going to say on the record that I saw him put the gun in the car. But is it, does that not matter because he's not supposed to be around guns and there's a gun within reaching distance or? Well, the, the conspiracy theory is they got Brazy out the way because Brazy and Finesse are signed to the same person. And as soon as Brazy came out, he went to diss and finesse. And as soon as Brazy got arrested, finesse made a post saying, I don't even have to kill my enemies, 48 laws of power, like he's celebrating the arrest of Honeycomb Brazy. So you think that he got set up? I mean, but I can't imagine a label setting up their own artist to go back to that's, prison. That's the conspiracy theory, but what kind of label sends you a convicted felon as a security guard? Well, maybe they just don't know. Maybe this is their go-to security guy and they don't know. Listen, I have go-to security guys, okay? Like, this could happen to me. If one of my go-to guys gets into some shit with his girl and isn't allowed to carry a gun, he's not going to tell me that. He still wants the checks that I'm giving him. And I get caught up in the exact same way. You know, this is why a lot of times I like to use like ex-cops and stuff or, you know, actual cops or retired cops because I know that they're at least going to be a lot more conscientious about their guns. Right. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, man, this is a, this is a mess, man. I, I hope he gets out because it's not like he didn't even do anything wrong. Well, this is the fucked up part about it. His criminal history 
um, is worse than anyone else he was in the vehicle with. Mm. Because of his criminal history and the fact that he has a Fed case, he could possibly be hit with the Armed Career Criminal Act and face a mandatory or a minimum 15 years uh, in federal prison. Damn. 15 years. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's sad, man. That's sad. Because it seemed like people rock with him. Yeah. There was an excitement when he got out. And now, man. Well, uh, Yo Gotti's brother, Big Juke, got killed in Memphis. Yeah. After leaving a funeral. I think they said his mom was around him when he got shot. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I haven't even yeah. done my homework on that situation. It's just an unfortunate, uh, an unfortunate thing. A lot of people are bringing it back to the Dolph situation. I, I, I don't really know, to be honest. Yeah, I actually looked it up. That there's a there's an article that basically said that, you know, their mother was in the car before he was killed, and she ran out of the car before the the shooting started, or something of that sort. But uh, yeah, listen, I don't know, I don't know these Memphis guys at all. I've never even been to Memphis last I checked. But from the outside looking in, this sounds like the young Dolph murder is still continuing. It's you know, his path of, of murder and mayhem, you know, of get back and everything else like that. And Dolph died a year and a half ago. Yeah. And now you got, now you got Yo Gotti's brother dead. I think Yo Gotti's restaurant got shot up right afterwards. A whole bunch of people have gotten arrested. Yeah, yeah man, I it's mean, that situation. It, it gets deep. Even the guy that allegedly put the murder together, his daughter got gunned down. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of killing behind it, but that's just what comes with it, unfortunately. And I highly doubt that this is going to be the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Until. Well, no, I mean, I mean, people get convicted, but then there's still lots of people that are out that are still that are still going. And you know what the sad part is? I remember, uh, you know, I had Crunchy Black on my show. and We were talking about this. And from what he understands, being a Memphis OG, he's saying that all this started over a girl. That's how a lot of shit starts. Yeah. I mean, people said that about Vaughn and Youngboy. Yeah. So it's like, that's how a lot of shit starts. Yeah. That's one of the fastest ways to die, bro. I mean, that's why me personally, I never fucked with a female that's married or something. Because that's one of the fastest ways to get yourself killed or into a crazy situation. And most times, it's not even your main girl. Like, Dolph got a baby mother with who I think had all his kids. And, you know, Gotti is, you know, messing with Angela Simmons. And you know what I'm saying? Not to say that Gotti had anything to do with it. I'm just saying that this is from the outside looking in. Yeah. But it's like, it's probably some side chick that someone had, you know, pillow talking. And next thing you know, people are dying over that dumb shit. But at the end of the day, the girl don't even matter. Yeah. I can imagine if it's your wife, it's your mother, it's your daughter. Okay. Now, now we got actual real problems. I'm, I have to see this person every day. This is someone I, I have very deep feelings for. We have a, 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 you know, a very strong connection. You can't just do whatever you feel like doing. But if it's just some chick you fucking on the side, eh, whatever. I'm not going to die over this shit. I'm not going to go to jail over this shit. Fuck her. Get a new one. It's pride, bro. Motherfuckers don't even look at it like that. They look at it like you disrespecting them. And once yeah. that happens, motherfuckers can't let it go. They willing to kill over it. Well, I guarantee you right now that Yo Gotti if that's the truth, he wishes that he had just let it go. Now he's missing his brother. Yeah. And his mother is now traumatized seeing her son get killed in front of her. Well, now they got to figure out another funeral and how they're going to pull that funeral off. Right. Without that getting shot up. Probably best to skip the funeral. Funerals ain't even safe. Point. Anything, there's nothing, you know what I'm saying? Everything's off limits. 
there's no way you're safe. So it's like, I don't know. Yeah, or have the funeral somewhere else. Go to a different state. You don't have to bury that person in Memphis. Like, it's a funeral, whatever. It's a fucking, you know, I pay to get my dad buried, but I don't think I've ever gone to his gravesite, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I never have. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of concrete, the dead body, you know, underneath it. Like, it's not, he's no longer here. You know, if I thought there was any level of danger of going to this funeral, I would have just had it somewhere else. Yeah. You know, not tell anybody. Well, the YNW Melly trial, we talked about this last time. It got delayed for a third time since our last interview, and they're not actually sure when it's going to start. Right. And they've dragged your name into it? Again, yeah. Again. So well, what's the, the most recent, you know, 1090 Jake affiliation with this case? <laughs> um, so there really, there isn't any affiliation. Uh, the detective Danny Polo, who got exposed... Um, he keep bringing me up and he wants to use an interview that I did with you and that I okay. did with, that I did with no jumper, um, that have nothing to do with Melly. The interviews, we're not even talking about Melly. It's me telling my life story. And there's hmm. like five or six more other YouTube videos. One of them is seven rappers that got ran down on. Um, they got some other videos of Melly that have to do with his affiliation. They got me exposing the Island Boys. I think what he's going for is Melly must be this gangster rapper because he's never been exposed and he's never been ran down on. How come Jake didn't treat Melly like the Island Boys? How come this rapper got ran down on but Melly didn't? I think that's the angle he's going for. What the fuck that has to do with the murder case, I have no fucking idea. Why I'm brought up, I don't know. Melly's lawyer said that he's a crazed fan of mine. So that's basically the situation. But yeah, I'm, I'm in the case. Okay, well, if they approach me about the shit, I'm not cooperating on any level. Yeah, you no. Can't, you, I'm can't a, have, I'm a... you can't have my raw footage or whatever else. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not playing along with this. Uh, nope. I'm sorry that you're getting dragged in through my interview, but it sounds like, the, you know, sounds like that's not the only thing they're trying to grasp the straws with. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, he had a, a mistrial, you know, a hung jury the first time. He's been locked up for what? Over three years now, right? It's been a while. And I mean, honestly, the, the worst update about his case isn't even the evidence. It's the witness tampering. Yeah. You talked about that last time, which has the life sentence in Florida. Yeah. That right there, um, that might turn out worse for him than the actual murder case. Right. You know, I just interviewed Fredo Bang, who is actually, you know, good friends with Melly. Melly went to Fredo's house after the alleged incident. Yeah. And I guess, you know, and I talked to Fredo about this. One of his songs, he was saying how they tried to subpoena him in the case and he just wasn't cooperating. They had to like re-subpoena him and then, but it ended up not working or whatever else. So he's just trying to stay away from this shit. Well, you dropped a song since our last interview called Free Melly. And you had some lines in there. Yeah. He said, uh, don't want to talk to feds. Probably got my digits. Free Melly. It's been love since the beginning. Talk about subpoena. Tell the lady I ain't. Talk about subpoena. Tell that lady I ain't get it. Yeah. If you ask my name, been in it. I ain't in it. Put some respect on my name when you spit it. So so talk about that line. What does that mean exactly? <laughs> uh, which part? Well, talk about subpoena. Tell the lady I ain't get it. I didn't get it. So did you get subpoenaed for that trial? Um I did and then but then they had to re subpoena me. Okay. But, but they ain't never said this. Aha. But I, I, think and I, I remember you you said that you're not cooperating in this thing. Yeah, no, I don't know nothing you don't about know it. Yeah, I'm really getting dragged into it. I'm really tired of it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I said, I, I whatever I, I say I am at, at the house eating McDonald's with my kiddies. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just I'm just being a dad right now. I don't got nothing to do with this stuff. He doesn't know anything. You know, what I mean, he's not. He wasn't there. He wasn't. You know, 
it's not like Melly showed up and just told him, you know, everything that happened. You know, I mean, I'm sure you're keeping your mouth shut, you know, at that point. And, you know, if it even happened, because we don't know that it really happened. Yeah. At this point, Melly is innocent at this very moment. But he's been sitting in jail for, I think, three to five years. It's been a while. It's been a while. You know, I thought he would get a bond after the, the mistrial, but no. No, they want him. And I mean, they got the prosecutor they have now is the one that prosecuted the XXX case and got mm -hmm. those four life sentences. Oh, three of them got life sentences. One got a short amount. He basically snitched his way out. And that kid that snitched in that case is a witness in this case now. In what way? I have no idea. I don't know if they had an interaction inside of jail. I don't know what happened. But that prosecutor who prosecuted that case not only has the same gang expert, but she brought the biggest snitch from that case, the only snitch, into Melly's. And he's cooperating in the Melly case. I mean, why not? You cooperate in the actual murder case of, of, with your friends. You might as well. Well, that's the thing. But that that was to get himself a deal. Yeah. There's no benefit to this. This is just. But there might be. There might be. You I mean, so? you know, because well, a lot of times, won't they? You know, you could get out earlier if you show that you've been a model inmate and you cooperate on other cases and stuff like that. I mean, all these are little check marks for you, right? I mean, I think in the feds, not in the state. In the state, once you get hit, you get hit. You know what I mean? Like, the state isn't as... It's not like they're bringing down the mafia in the state of Florida. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, <laughs> look, gang shit. You know what I mean? So he got, like, four years or whatever it was in state prison. Got out. I think he's got, like, 20 years of probation. So unless he's trying to snitch off the probation, I don't know. But... He's in the case. Well, speaking of Florida, uh, Kodak Black is back in jail. Yeah. Did you follow this case? Uh, I've looked into it, yeah. So from what I understand, they found him in his car asleep, high off some drug. Yeah. When they originally arrested him, I guess they said it was cocaine, but they went back and said, no, it's not cocaine, it's uh, oxy. Yeah, from what I heard, um, they said he was eating it or trying to do something along those lines. But then they also say in his defense, he was parked outside of a friend's house. And like you said, he was actually prescribed the drug that they found. So he had a Fed case, but now it's going back to state because of that new evidence that it wasn't cocaine. And apparently he's prescribed what he was caught with. Me personally, I hope that, you know, the time that he's in there, he's able to sober up and get his mind right so that when he comes home, it's a better, improved Kodak. You know, jail, nobody wants to go to jail, but sometimes that mental clarity of being inside of there and being sober can do something for you where you can get a positive effect. I think a lot of us have seen Kodak's been going through some shit. He doesn't seem sober. I don't even think the 6 9 thing was done with a sober mind. Hopefully that this situation can have some type of positive impact. Well, if you get pulled over with a drug that you have a prescription for, why are you in jail? I have no idea. I mean, maybe it wasn't in the proper container. Maybe because of what he was doing, the police thought it was illegal. I'm not sure what the situation is, but then again, he's a big name where he's from. Maybe those, those officers felt a certain type of way about him. There's a lot of corruption in Broward County, so I wouldn't be surprised if somebody got it out for him. Well, yeah, they're saying that, because, you know, Trump pardoned him. They're saying that he might have to serve out that original sentence. I don't think that's going to happen because that was federal and he's already being sent back to Broward County. Ah, okay. So the Fed aspect is getting dropped. And if the Feds are dropping it, the state is most likely going to be dropping it. Bradford Cohen, the lawyer he got, does not fuck off. 
This is the lawyer that you want if you're in Florida. So it's like, I mean, this dude's represented Melly, Pooh Shiesty. The list goes on. I'm pretty sure he got this situation covered. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I've, I've said this before. I feel like Kodak Black is this generation's DMX. Mm. Someone who has a huge fan base, who's loved by fans, who has big songs, who has drug issues that he can't seem to kick and is always in and out of jail, in and out of rehab, and continuously struggling with it. And yeah, when you're young and you know, you're, you're vibrant, this works out. You, you could get by with it. You could bounce back or whatever else. But as you start getting older and losing more of your teeth and, you know, the, the styles have moved on, it's it's going to go on a very downhill path. You know, so hopefully he, you're right. Hopefully in jail he can kick it. But then again, getting drugs in jail, especially if you're Kodak Black, is probably not all that hard. It depends. If they're holding him in confinement, then he's not getting shit. Feel you. Well, uh, his friend Psycho Bob, you had actually posted uh, an interrogation video. Yeah. But what was that about? Um, somebody made a video accusing Psycho Bob of snitching. And I actually looked into the case, uh, read all the paperwork, decided to pull the interrogation, and Psycho Bob held it down. He didn't say shit. So, you know, I wanted to post that uh, just to shout out a real one. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's still locked up. His mother got killed last time, you know, we did our interview. Uh, yeah, man. So so him and Kodak Black are locked up right now. Yeah, and I mean, that's that was another aspect as to why I wanted to put the interrogation video out because... um. When you say somebody's a snitch and you expose them, you know, on the street, it doesn't do anything. When you do that to somebody that's in a federal prison, that can lead to some shit. Yeah. So, um, you know, we heard about the Glock 9 situation. So, you know, it's good to, to clear somebody's name before something turns into something that it doesn't need to be. Well, the, the Young Thug YSL trial is still underway. Yeah. And uh, right now, the, the YSL co-founder, Tick, has been on the stand. Yeah. So uh, the amusing part about all this <laughs> is like uh, the acronyms. So according to Tick, SLIME stands for Slug, Love, I, Me, Everything. <laughs> He clearly did not think this one out. Yeah, I mean, Sl slug love, I meet everything. If uh, if somebody was to testify on me, I would hope it's him, because the 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 information that he's given to the state is fucking useless. So um, you know, if that's his truth and that's the truth that he has to offer, it is what it. I I don't even know if that's snitching what he's doing, because it's like. He's on the stand, but the shit that he's saying, I don't know. Yeah, you know, the, the thing that gets me about watching him on the stand is like, I don't know anything about the YSL guys. I've never interviewed any of them. Uh, you know, I have no affiliation with them. Uh, I've interviewed Lucci a couple of times. You know, free Lucci, I hope he pulls through. But yeah. Young Thug and that crew, I've never had, I've never even been, never even had a conversation with them. I may have been in the same room as some of them, but yeah, that's Thug, but nah, we've never even had a conversation before. But seeing this guy on the stand, this guy Tick, who is allegedly the YSL co-founder, I'm sure that at his height on the street, he was this feared individual. Oh, that's the YSL co-founder guy who's down with Young Thug and he's got all these people around him and, and everything else like that. Seeing this guy on the stand with his gray hair, he looks like a teenager, a scared teenager. He looks terrified. 
knowing that every single word that he says is being recorded and broadcast to the world. He's going to have to go back to jail to deal with whatever repercussions from that day's a testimony. He has to come up with ridiculous acronyms like slug glove, I, I mean everything. And, and it just shows like, you know, all that tough guy shit just goes away. It's all a facade. You think so? Man, seeing him on that stand, he looks terrified. I'm going to be honest with you, right? When I went to jail for the first time in the county, we got wristbands. And on the wristband, it's going to say your name, your inmate number, and it's going to have your mugshot. And when you see somebody's mugshot just from the neck up, you might think that that motherfucker's small, looks scared, this and that. But they a straight killer inside of the dorm. You know what I mean? So, like, for me, I don't know. Looks could be deceiving. Maybe he is trying to put on an image for the benefit of whatever's going on. I, I understand all that. I'm not saying this guy is soft. I'm not saying he, he's not a gangster or anything else like that. But I, I do know people. At 50 years old, I, I can see people's energy. He, he would be any. He would rather be anywhere on earth than on that stand, right? Oh now. yeah, yeah. That that he can't be tough on that stand. He can't be gangster on. He can't intimidate anybody on that stand. The people who are asking him those questions that he has to answer have all the power over him. Right. He can't jump over and, and attack him physically. That's going to just make it worse. And, and it it just sort of shows where. A lot of this gangster, tough guy stuff ends up with you on the stand, scared to death, knowing that the wrong word is going to send you away forever. You know what I mean? Being being questioned by a person who you wouldn't even talk to in the real world. Yeah. And you have to answer all their questions like like you're a you're a, a student in high school. You know what I mean? And it, it's just. You know, that whole trial, too, is a fucking circus. Like, it's insane. Like, remember, like, the video feed got hacked at one point? Yeah. <laughs> and then some guy that sounded like he was from, like, England or something was like, free young thug, mistrial, with, like, a really deep accent and everything else like that. And now uh, the, the state actually uh, asked for, uh, you know, a motion to turn off all the video feeds. Yeah. I mean, how do you think this thing will end up? Do you think that that thug will end up getting convicted over this, or do you think there's such a circus that he'll go free? Well, this is the thing. Um, if that courtroom is used to being a circus, then that's just how it functions. It could still end with him getting fucked. It just it might look worse than other cities and states how they do things over there. But I think I think thug got a shot. I think he got a shot, really. Yeah. I mean, he's got the best lawyer in Georgia. You know, um, you know, I mean, look, and he said the thug stands for truly humble under God. <laughs> I mean, did juries ever buy this ridiculousness? Slug love, I mean, everything, truly humble under God. Like, does anyone really buy this? I don't know. Mm. Maybe. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, the DA, uh, Fonnie Willis, she's got a whole set of problems herself. Uh, they're saying that the, the victim, Nut, who got killed over this whole alleged beef situation, that she was dating him. And this is like a personal thing for her. Now in the Trump Rico case, she was saying that she was messing around with one of the prosecutors also. And they're trying to, you know, listen, I mean, you're going up against millionaires multi multi-millionaires with all the money in the world to fight for their freedom yeah all the money in the world trump could fundraise and make an extra 20 30 million in an afternoon to get all types of private investigators and, and whoever else to come in you know it was funny trump actually posted my um sammy the bull uh interview on his yeah. instagram yeah oh yeah that, that came out of nowhere basically it was a clip Sammy the Bull was saying how 
they try to bribe him to lie about Trump's mob affiliations, which he had none. And like Steve Wynn, um, you know, try to send some guys to get uh, Sammy to say that Trump had mob affiliations so he couldn't open a, a hotel casino in Vegas. And Sammy was like, I don't know, you know, I was never able to get to him. You want me to lie? How much are you going to pay me for lying? They're like, oh, well, you know, these are like ex-FBI. Just like, oh, no, we're not saying lie. Like, well, if you want him to lie, how much are you going to pay me for lying? I can lie if you want, but how much is Steve Wynn going to pay me? Well, it was, my, it was my son's restaurant. That whole thing disappeared, what I was just talking about. Um, two agents, ex-agents, big-name agents. I can't remember their name, uh, but he's a big name. And he came and talked to me. He says, I'm retired. I work for Steve Wynn. Um, who owns the Wynn Casinos in Las Vegas? Who owns the Wynn Billionaire. Casinos? Billionaire. Yeah. He had casinos even in Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. Trump moved into Atlantic City and was his competitor and now is going to go to Vegas and open up his casinos. So these agents wanted me to tell them something about Trump so that uh, he, they can go in front of the Gaming Commission and he wouldn't be able to get a license in Vegas, and he would lose his license in um, Atlantic City. Got it. So they wanted you to say that Trump was somehow tied to the mafia because when it comes to these gaming licenses, if you're at all mafia affiliated, they'll you're just they'll just shut you down. Right. Because basically, the mafia started the casinos in Vegas to begin with, so right. they don't want a piece of that. So they said. Sammy, it's very important to Steve Wynn. Very important. Tell us something, anything. And I said, do uh, you want me if I lie? I'll tell you a lie. <laughs> Come on, Sammy, we're, we're, we're ex-agents. Well, I just told you I don't know, and I tried to get to him once, and I couldn't get to him, but let me ask you a question. Steve Wynn is heavyweight. He owns casinos and all kinds of shit. If I tell you something that hurts Trump, do I get a piece of the a casino? <laughs> do I get a very big, important job in the casino? Right. Then maybe uh, if he wants me to lie, what's his offer? Yeah. Oh, Sammy, we, we can't use the word lie. I don't give a fuck what you could use. <laughs> I told you four times, I don't know if the guy ever did anything illegitimate. Right. He didn't do it with me. And I tried to get into his pockets a little bit. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't budge. And I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to go up and gorilla the guy. I just walked away. And then Trump, Trump posted that to show how he's innocent and how the, you know, the judges, people are actually, what's weird is that people are saying that it's kind of a veiled threat to the judges by having this mafia hitman kind of speak on his behalf. It's sort of like a veiled threat in a way. I, I don't know, man. It's crazy. You get deep. I mean, with Fanny, I feel like she bit off more than she could chew. Yeah, I agree. She, she was trying to do the most and now it's starting to, to backfire. Yeah, no, I mean, she went overboard. I mean, she she arrested a million people. All of them are still in jail. You know, it, it, it's, yeah, the trial took forever to start. And it uh, doesn't seem like it's over anytime soon. Seems mm -hmm. like we got months to go. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, Blueface is back in jail. Yeah. Uh, I guess it was a probation violation. Mm -hmm. Do you know the details about this? I don't know the details. I know that. He's in the most toxic relationships in America. Right. I'm pretty sure that's what did it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess allegedly he won't be out until the summer. I mean, that's not too bad, but I already heard they said Krishan Rock is saying she loves him and misses him. And she pulled up and the baby was just on the seat. No, no, like baby seat nothing just the baby just laying on the seat and i mean 
the shit that they got going on, bro, is like a career killer. It's 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 crazy. Or 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 a career maker, because honestly, everyone's tuning in to watch this train wreck of a relationship. Yeah, I mean, like it make it makes the females careers, but I can't imagine it's doing anything good for his. And then now he's in jail. You know what I'm saying? So. Well, according to him, he likes it in there. He said, hey, I love it here. It's active. It's cracking. <laughs> Blueface with the shit, but that's just, it's not, it's not good for money. And he actually, he hit me up at one point. Really? By what? Uh, there was some rumors that Krishan might have snitched in a murder case. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't get anything from it. Uh, wherever it happened, I can't access it. It was just something that came and went. But um, yeah, their their relationship is deep. Soldier Boy, who Blueface was beefing with before he got locked up, uh, made a video saying that Blueface is lucky he doesn't pay some booty bandits three thousand dollars to rape him in prison. Uh, that that's crazy. Uh, yeah, Soldier Boy knows how to stay relevant. Yeah, I don't know anyone that'll uh, rape someone in prison. I, I don't. I couldn't make a phone call like that. Now I ain't gonna lie. Three thousand dollars, you can make something happen in prison. Well, well, yeah, it's interesting, right? Because I had Fredo Bang uh, on my show recently. We filmed it down in um, New Orleans. Yeah. When he was locked up in Baton Rouge, someone paid this dude a thousand dollars to like attack him. A thousand dollars. A thousand dollars to to attack him, not to kill him, but but to to put hands on him. That's that's expensive. And he kind of what's that? That's expensive. I got cut for fifty. Fifty bucks. I got for fifty dollars. I got my face slashed with a razor. Damn. I guess it's cheaper in Florida. Well, in Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana. No, I'm saying I was in oh, Florida. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. As you were saying, Florida's cheaper than Louisiana. I guess, it, I I guess it's cheaper yeah, yeah. over that. $1,000 in Florida, you're going to get somebody killed. Well, what what he said was, when I asked him, I said, how much does it cost to kill someone in prison? He said, two, $3,000 will do it. How much to kill someone in prison? What's the going rate, if you now, were to just put it up? I don't know, but I know you yeah, Dan Ivey did for about, about two, 3000 Two, 3000 That's all it takes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was in there, you had gangs, and the gangs would go by the number that the gang represents. So, like, if the GDs rocked a six-point style, they're going to want $600. If the Kings rocked the five, they're going to want $500. And, you know, anything, a couple hundred dollars, bro, you're making somebody want to do some shit. You're talking about anything over a thousand dollars. That helicopter has to come. Like that, somebody's getting punished. You got people in there killing for fucking free. You know what I mean? Like people are literally killing in there over ass and noodles. And so when you offer somebody some money that they haven't touched in in years, it, that shit gets done. I mean, is it really that cheap? You could really have someone killed for a couple thousand dollars? You could get someone killed for less than that. And, and what's the, the rationale behind it? Is it, hey, I'm already doing double, triple life. What's another body? Who cares? Because there's always more severe, you know, punishments, right? You could be put in solitary for years. You could be put in ADX. Like, like there's, your life could be worse. You could beat the murder. You could not get charged. There's people that get clapped in prison and nobody knows what happened. There's not cameras everywhere that, that'll capture it? Man, what? I was at prisons with no cameras. Wow. That shit's not updated. The jails are updated. Florida is the projects of prison. We didn't have, wow. we didn't have AC in that motherfucker. We had windows that stayed open. Daytime, nighttime. If rain blows in, rain blows in, floods the cell out. We didn't have <laughs> AC. We didn't have cameras in that bitch. No metal detectors, none of that shit. So it's like, it's going the fuck down. You know what I'm saying? Like the newer buildings that they were putting 
would have cameras. But I was in a dorm that was open bay, bunk beds everywhere. And this is a high custody level dorm. This isn't like a low custody. Nah, there's bunk beds, but it's high custody. People are getting cut in their sleep, stabbed, all type of shit. No cameras. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, stay out of prison, kids. Speaking of Blueface, you and his manager, WAC 100, got into it. Yeah, like multiple times. Uh, okay. And me and WAC had our problems. You know, we had to be for like 10 years. We had this argument over the phone, over some dumb shit. You know, he started talking crazy to me. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to talk to you anymore if you go, if this is what how arguments work out with you. And, but, you know, we got older, we got over it. There was some business on the table and we worked it all out. You know, I did an interview with Gain and he, that he showed up at. Then I did an interview with him by himself. And now I mean him communicate and everything else like that. So Wack is not crazy. You know what I'm saying? He's not reckless. He's intelligent. He's mature. You can work things out with Wack, you know, if you talk to him. So what exactly is the issue with you and Wack? I don't know. Um, it first started when I said something about 6 9 And then uh, the latest thing was the BG situation. Well, didn't he expose the BG situation? Um, he popped it off, and then I found more to it. So he had some paperwork. Me and him actually spoke. He had some paperwork. I had more. He didn't know that BG actually took the stand in the grand jury. Um, that was something that I found. And he wanted things presented a certain way. I presented it in a different way. I think that he wanted me to do to BG what I did to King Yella. Um, and then that wasn't it, too. He got into it with a L.A. rapper, I think, uh, Big Sad 1900, where he said Big Sad snitched. And, you know, I looked into it, and I didn't agree, so I didn't cover it. And that basically ended whatever me and Wack, you know, that temporary, uh, we were all right, that pretty much ended that. Cause I'm not, I'm not gonna do what someone. If if I don't agree with it, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not somebody's do boy. I work for me. Your opinion isn't mine, and I'm not gonna change my opinion just for you. So that's more or less where it's at. Well, cause you guys kind of do the same thing to a certain degree. Yeah, right? I mean, I guess yeah. But I mean, whack, similar. Whack whack picks and chooses too, though. Yeah. So it's like, you know, but as we figured out, pretty much everybody does that. I mean, can you guys talk it out and get past your differences? Or do you think that y'all just don't rock with each other? Yeah, we probably could. I mean, I asked Adam to uh to sit us down on the table before. Um, I asked them if they want to do a podcast in Florida together. But I uh, shit, I think we do more numbers having the issue. So if that's what it is, fuck it. I mean, you know, if you guys want to sit down on Vlad TV, I could probably make that happen. Hey. You know, I'll have I'll have police security in the, you know, in the room. No, make sure I don't stupid want police happens. security. I want my own security in there. You could bring your own security. Yeah. He can bring his security and I'll have my security. You know yeah. what I mean? But I'll have LAPD there who's the biggest gang of them all. <laughs> you know what I mean? That all the other gangs will bow down to. Right? That'd be a crazy all the situation. Other security, all the other security guards are going, you know, you know, your guys don't have helicopters and battering yeah. rams and, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> tanks and, and the such. They're you know what I'm saying? They're better equipped. My, my security got all that. You yeah. know, I, I remember getting into a conversation because one of my uh, New York security guys, he's actual active NYPD. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I only get to use him sometimes because he's, he's working, right? And he told me flat out, and I didn't realize this at the time, NYPD is the biggest police force in the world. The world. Not New York State, not the country, in the world. There's more NYPD officers 
than any other police force on the planet. Damn. And, you know, they have surface-to-air missiles at their disposal, you know, because the whole 9-11 thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can act as tough as you want. When actual police kind of step in and, and have to hold things down, everyone is going to fold. Yeah. You know, in the long term. Maybe maybe they might act tough in the moment, but <clears throat> at the end of the day, you don't want them calling for backup. Yeah. You know, everyone's going down. Well, I hope you all work it out. If you want, I can try to work on that. You down for it? Are you open to it? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if everything makes sense, yeah. We got some shit to talk about, and we can uh, make something happen that makes sense for everybody. I'm not opposed yep. to it. There you go. Well, uh, well, when I interviewed WAC 100, we talked about the whole situation about Eric Holder and Nipsey Hussle. Yeah. And what he said, you know, because a lot of people got on him over some of the statements he made about Nipsey. And what he said was, in the rules of the jungle, if you call someone a snitch who's a gangster, they're expected to retaliate. So he's not happy what happened to Nipsey, but he's also not surprised yeah. over the situation. He also said something to the effect of how Eric Holder and Nipsey got into it a few days prior to the actual murder. You had made some comments, though, about Eric Holder, you said that this is what a gangster is supposed to do when someone calls him a snitch. I think I was interviewing with Reggie. Um, I don't know what podcast he was on. And he asked me what was my thoughts on it. And you know, um, at the end of the day, the rules of the jungle is the rules of the jungle. Mm -hmm. You know, when you call somebody certain things, every action gets a reaction. And this particular individual, everybody knew dude was a rider. You know, they knew he was about that life. You know, you can't call a, a dude a snitch in his face and expect him not to respond. Now, I don't think, I think Nipsey was, might have been upset about something else because it really don't seem like him just to do that, but he did that. And... It's no shock. It's like everybody's like, oh, shit, what happened? You know what happened a million times. Dude called him a snitch. He came back. He killed him. Well, I, I interviewed Cowboy, who was right there next to Nipsey when it happened. From what he saw, it wasn't like shitty cuz walked up to him. He's like, oh, you get your snitch ass away from me. It was, hey, man, I've been hearing that you, you got some paperwork, so, you know, you should get that cleared up. It's like, oh, man, dudes are hating. It's like, yeah, man, just, you know, just get it cleared up. And they, they shook hands and... It, it was really from... Did from he tell them same two dudes that just had a fight a week prior? What do you mean? This is what I said. Wait, say it again. I missed what that you said. That them same two dudes that just had a fight a week prior? The same two dudes? Yeah. Talking about Cowboy? Shitty and Nipsey. Shitty cuz and Nipsey Hustle got into a fight? They had a fight a week prior to that. I, I never heard that. Yeah, this is a fact. I'm not saying it's, it's not true. I just yeah. said I never heard that. Um, I mean, how do you feel about that? Like, if someone approached, you know, during the days when you were active and everything else like that, if someone approached you and accused you of snitching or asked you about snitching, would you react violently in that case? Are you expected to react that way? Uh, it, it depends on how the situation comes about because if your organization approaches you and says, look, we heard an allegation, we want to hear your side of it, and we want to get down to the bottom of it, they're giving you the opportunity to basically plead your case. And you might be able to politic yourself out of that situation. Um, when it comes down to prison, normally it's if you're going to expose somebody, you got to be the one that handles it too. So, oh, he snitched on you? Well, go stab him. And then it's vice versa. Oh, he's saying you snitched? Well, you know what you need to do. It's not even snitching like you got gay rumors in prison. If somebody claims that you were doing something with somebody, even if you did it, you still got to go and hit that person that said that. And even if you did it, you're going to sway the crowd through violence. So you'll have situations where somebody might have snitched, 
but he just went and popped the shit out of dude that said it. And now everybody's rocking with him because he's the last <laughs> man standing. So it's like, you know, Wack isn't wrong with what he's saying. Um, it's just people don't like the truth. People love Nipsey and there is a romanticism about him considering how young he was when he died and the situation around him and L.A. mourned him and he had the Staples Center doing his funeral. and Yeah, so, so people don't want to hear the realities of, you know, certain situations like, like Tupac. Like, you know, the more I get into the story, the more I research, the more people I talk to, you, you come to the conclusion that Tupac kind of sealed his own fate by jumping on Orlando. Yeah, he yeah. had absolutely no business doing that. Not not someone like that. Not someone who is an active gang member who's being investigated for multiple murders. This is not a guy you jump on when you're a rapper. Right. A lot of people, too, they like to feed into the fantasy that uh, Tupac was a gangster. Yeah. And for people that go to breaking down his life and how he actually grew up, People will take it as you're being disrespectful and tarnishing his legacy, even though that was his actual life. So, I mean, with Nip, though, bro, in my humble opinion, I feel like a lot of that shit was fake because a lot of people really weren't even, like, treating him like that until he died. Well, that's always going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, I mean, that was one of the things that me and Wack talked about. He basically was saying, you know, I said, Nip, you know, Wack said people got on him by saying, Nip wasn't a legend when he died because he didn't have the catalog to stand behind that. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that that does make sense because at the time that he died, he had a lot of records that people liked, but there was no hit songs. There was no huge hits. Yeah, you know, I, I, album... I remembered when he slapped the shit out of somebody at the BET Awards. Yeah. Like, that was like, other than that, I didn't really know him. But after he died... It was like, damn, you know, like, brush, that shouldn't even have been him. Like, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. I didn't really know too much about him. Like, I wouldn't say he's like, I don't know. I don't even want to say anything about that like that. But it's just, you know, a lot of motherfuckers got fake love for people. Well, he didn't have the musical accolades of a Biggie, a Tupac, a Jay-Z, a Drake, a Kendrick. You know, like all these guys have huge number one records where they drop, you know, Time stops and everyone's listening to their stuff. Nipsey was was an underground artist. He was on his way. And that last album I thought was brilliant. That last album, if he had been alive to promote it and push it and go on tour, may have put him in that category. Might have pushed him over the top. But unfortunately, he died still, you know, grinding and still trying to establish his musical career to where he wanted it to go. Right. And this album was a dope album. Like, you know, listening to it, I was crying and, you know, like, yo, because I've interviewed him before. I've been around him before. We, we've run into each other. We've had conversations. We were supposed to do a second interview at one point. It didn't happen. But I have only good things to say about Nipsey. But, yeah, I mean, people don't want to hear it for what it was. I mean, listen, certain people feel like I remember Special Ed in my interview said that he doesn't feel that Biggie's a legend because he only had two albums. And he feels like Puffy sort of painted him as that to try to kind of, because you know, that was his biggest artist and he's gone now. So, oh, what better way to kind of put value to this catalog by saying he's the greatest rapper of all time and romanticize. I'm going to be honest. I think that because of his past and, and because of Puffy's love of marketing and legacy, I think they kind of like, um, you know, got it to where that became the status quo. But Biggie was nice. Biggie was another nice rapper. I don't think he had enough uh, albums to make those claims. Yeah. You know, he was a very great artist, you know, spit, his flow. It kind of reminded me of myself, at, at you know, at times. You know, and there's arguments for both ways. You could also say, yes, he only dropped two albums, but those two albums were immense, were huge albums with big songs. So... You know, everyone has their own definition of it, man. It, it, it is what it is. Uh, rest in peace, Nipsey Hussle. You know, uh, my condolences to his family. I've never said anything negative about him. Um, you know, but but at one point, you do have to look at things realistically and say, 
okay, certain things just are what they are. You know? Yeah, I mean, I'd say he's more of a legend to the culture than just the music. Yeah, I agree. Well, uh, you know, since you started doing interviews with me, some of my other guests uh, have chimed in in terms of their opinions about you. Uh, young Jock, uh, who does interviews with my man Sean Prez, uh, in one of his interviews he said, uh, people call Vlad the feds, but 1090 Jake is doing what I've seen police do. You know what's interesting? And I don't know 1090 Jake, got nothing against him. But I, here's my thing, you know, a lot of people come at Vlad here for saying Vlad, the police and this and that type shit, Vlad the feds. But I, you don't really hear Vlad speak much uh, as far as like, I mean, you hear him speak on his interviews because he's interviewing people. But I mean, people, you, you relinquish whatever in, uh, information you want to relinquish, whatever you mm -hmm. give up, that's on you. Mm -hmm. That ain't Vlad. So if people, are, if the police happen to be watching and if you gave up that information, that's on you, not Vlad. That's, you, you felt that comfortable on the platform to release incriminating evidence against yourself? That's not the platform. That's you, fool. 1090 Jake is doing what I've seen the police do. I don't know you, 1090 Jake. I don't think. I don't know if we ever met or not, but that's the same thing the police did in this situation to further break down their income. Let's burn up Gunner. Let's burn him. He, oh, he'll snitch. A lot of times when you in these, when you in these jails, how you think these niggas get shanked up? Cause the deputy telling somebody, you know, nigga snitch. You know, he his won't turn the state up as well. Yeah, you know, paperwork, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna send you a little copy of the paperwork. You see he snitched on your man over there. It ain't other inmates. How the fuck? They ain't going to court. They ain't in the court with you. How they know who's... The, the, the police would release information to make it look bad. Let's say this. Let's just say that moment that Gunner was in that courtroom and said, yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm agreeing to we be in the game. A gang. If they never released that footage, would y'all be calling Gunner a, 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 a rat? You wouldn't. Who released that? The mm. authorities. So what the fuck is 1090 Jake doing? And somebody could say, hey man, he putting us about some real shit. He letting us know what's going on. Is he fact checking? Is he fact checking? Or is he snitching? He doing what the police do. I want to shut you down, but I go to the hood. I tell your ops everything you got going on. I don't got to tell your ops. I tell your loved ones what you got going on, nigga. We'll change up the whole scenario. So what is 1090 Jake doing? What, what's the, what, we, we fact checking now? Because if I need to get your information, I gotta go to the courts. Do I publicly Google it? I gotta go talk to some investigator. Who I talk to to get this information on you? And why are you going so hard to get information on people? And I'm not taking nothing away from 1090 Jake. I mean, he got a great platform. I've been watching this show. I'm like, okay, all right. But then somewhere I'll be like, uh, it's creating a lot of issues and tension out here. Absolutely. People against people, because now they feel like, oh man, 1090 Jake said woo the woo, but I'm going with it. I'm standing on it. So I don't know. I don't know who worse. He he's, I guess, implying that putting out information and exposing people is what police does, and that's what you do as well. Yeah, then he got to be dumb as fuck because, I mean, I'm literally reading public record. But um, if that's his take on it, that's his take on it. Well, he also said that uh, he looks at you as a Karen type for telling on people that's been telling on people. Yeah, I mean, I look at him like he gay as a bitch. I mean, you remember the head thing that he did? Like, the people I know ain't looking at him like he, whatever the fuck he think he is, so... If that's what he want to take it, I don't, I don't know. That's his opinion, I guess. You can't you can't get big and not have opinions about you from all from all sides. It's just it comes to the territory. Yeah, who who interviewed him? I, I don't I don't do interviews with him myself. This is Sean Press, one of my interviewers. Yeah, my name been brought up a couple times by him because I actually commented on one of his interviews, and I said the second I hear his voice. I turned the shit off because he just talks so fucking much. And uh, he's brought me up a couple times in interviews. And every time he's brought me up, it's been in a negative light. 
So I just, I take that into consideration when, uh, when my name gets brought up by the same interviewer and the people he's asking me about just so happen to say some negative shit. I don't know if it comes from that comment or what, but. Well, I remember I brought your name up when I interviewed Math Hoffa uh, a couple of interviews before. And, and he, his take is that he's not buying all your claims because he's not, he's never double checked any of your work. I had 1090 Jake here yesterday. Yeah. And he talked about all the people who he has actual paperwork on who cooperated. That he's like very transparent about it. Like, mm -hmm. here's how I, here's how I got the paperwork and here's how you could go and get it yourself to verify it. Right. Like he's that tra shows like go to this website, blah, blah, blah. Like in Florida, you can look up anything. Right. Boston Richie, uh, finesse two times. Like these people have great careers. They're, so you're saying there's paperwork on him? There's paperwork on him, according to him. I haven't verified it myself, according but he him. was, what's that? According to him. According to him, but but he's actually saying, here's how you can look it up yourself. Okay, I mean, did did, did you look it up? I did not look it up. Okay, but you're here repeating. I am here repeating what he said. What he said. <laughs> yeah. But and it's that, how, and it's that to me is a violation, because there's two things that I can't put on somebody without seeing actual evidence, and that's snitching, and you know all the, the all the backdoor play. I can't mm -hmm. I can't accuse anybody of, of none of this shit, or, or or put that tag on them, or even mention their name in the same sentence or something like that, mm -hmm. because I don't know. Okay, fair enough. And that's something that I grew up not playing with. Like, yeah. You don't play with that shit. That's the easiest cop out, though. You know, a lot of people say that, but then they don't go looking for the shit. Ooh. You know, uh, with with the little boom situation, Flacco said that the video exonerated Little Boom. He said that before he even saw the video. He said that he wouldn't agree with anything I said until he went and looked at it for himself. All the documents are publicly available. You can pull them up in two minutes. But the thing is, a lot of people don't want to go look for it. So I don't really know Math Hoffa. I don't never interacted with him. But a lot of people are looking for shit with their eyes closed. And what I mean by that is a lot of people purposely avoid shit so they don't have to talk about it or put a stamp on it. Yeah, listen, when he asked me, you know, did I verify all this? I said, no, I did not. I did not. He goes, okay, this is what I mean. But it's like the other day. I verified it's all, it. It's, it's publicly available. At the end, of the, at the end of the day, I verified it. Either. it. That's, that's, yeah. that's how I built my name. And who the fuck I put some fake shit out on? Nobody. Yeah, my name real solid when it comes to that shit. So yeah. I'm the one that fact check it. If he didn't know. But there you go. That's why motherfuckers ain't questioning it after the fact. People just don't yep. like the face that's doing it. Like Boosie said when he first spoke ab about me with you. If he was any other race, it wouldn't be an issue. 1090 Jake said like, Three of the people in the double XL freshman issues are snitches right. and have paperwork. Right. You know what I'm saying? More and more and more and more and more. Like more paperwork and more is and popping out of the like woodwork. It's just, it's just bro, like it's just, crazy. It's just, it's just bad, bro. It's just crazy. Appreciate 1090 Jake too, bro. Like, yeah, you fuck with him? Yeah, I fuck with him, bro. If it wasn't for him, bro, shit. And if he was a different color, <laughs> it'd be all gravy. Oh man, people are more scared of him than me these days. Hey, bro, like <laughs> I'm grateful for 1090 Jake, bro. I smile every time. <laughs> we gotta get him on the show, man. You gotta uh, get 1090 Jake. I'll put hey, him on, bro. You, like you bro, just demanded that, bro. Like you just demanded it. He one of the last ones I got left, bro. Shit. Hey, man, listen. Being white in hip hop is a very interesting place to be. Because when I make comments that people disagree with, like, for example, you know, I made some comments about Taraji P. Henson, where I said, listen, I don't understand why she's complaining about not getting paid what she feels she deserves when she could be making her own projects. Mm. And an army of people responded with, you shouldn't be allowed to talk about black people's business. Go, go talk about your own people. Like, you know, that, that, that's always the first knee-jerk reaction. Yeah. 
what, which what, obviously makes no sense. What if what if you set it back? What do you mean? What if you reversed it? Right, and and I have mentioned this in interviews. That so so the reverse is well. Then if you're black, you shouldn't be allowed to talk about white people. <laughs> Ooh, you finna get canceled. <laughs> right, <laughs> which gone. means that you can't actually talk say, about me. Say, like, say, if say you're, with Doctor Umar Johnson what he said about Eminem. Reverse yeah. that and see what happens. Oh yeah, no, we we talked about this, and you know Umar has responded to me. You know he's called me an agent, and you know whatever else. And, and my thing is like, yo, you've been talking about building the school now seven years ago in my interview and even earlier, earlier than that, you still haven't built it. You asking me how many schools I built. You haven't built a school that's open either. And I haven't been taking money from people for the last decade about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, and the argument of you can't be the best something if another race invented that genre is a little bit silly because who's the best golfer of all time? Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. Best Black. basketball player. Ma you know, Michael Jordan or LeBron, depending on who you're I don't even to. think there's a white guy that's top five. I don't think Larry Bird's top five in basketball. So it's like, yeah. you know, when you want to say stupid shit like that, uh, I feel like this. Don't be surprised or don't get mad when you find the opposite of what you're saying, I'm not going to say it because I don't believe it. But there's people that feel just like you. They just look like me. They feel the same way you feel. It's just reversed. I don't agree with either perspective. So don't throw me in the mix with that shit. Yeah. I mean, look, there have been, to counter his point, and, and listen, Umar knows how to, how to trigger people. He, he's good at it. I, I, I get it. But at the end of the day, you could find thousands of examples of someone coming from a different culture and becoming a top person in a culture that they did not grow up in. You know, th th there have been, and I actually looked this up this morning, there have been grand champions in Japanese sumo that were like Hawaiian or Samoan. They came in, they followed the rules, they became the top guys in their field, and they were celebrated by the whole culture. They probably don't even speak Japanese, but they came in that sport. It was a very traditional Japanese only, you know, clickish type thing, but they came in and did what they did. Eminem came in. And I think if you talk to most real hip hop fans, they would put Eminem in the top five or their top 10 or whatever else. Hell yeah. You know, and apart from Tom Brady, all the best football players are black. You know, when you look at the top 10 of football, yes, Tom Brady is number one. You, you got to give him that, right? But then after that, everyone's black. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, the Jerry Rice, uh, you know. Uh, boxers, you know, too. You, you look at the boxers. boxers. Yeah, dude, these were all thing. sports that, that were launched by by white people or, or, or so forth. But the best people ended up dominating the sport. And that's okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And, um, you know, but you'll get a lot more views polarizing people as opposed to kind of bringing them together. Of course. And, uh, yeah, it just it just is what it is. And, uh, you know, Umar, when you actually open your school, I'll do an interview at that school. <laughs> you know, and you can make me eat my words. But up until this point, you've been asking, begging people for money for a decade now for a school that still hasn't opened. So don't, don't talk about, well, how many schools has Vlad opened? Because I haven't been taking people's money. You know what I'm saying? All right, so what's next for you? Well, like I said in the beginning, snitching is pretty much over with. Uh, early on in my YouTube career, and I mean like before 50,000 subscribers, I did interviews. And I feel like I want to tap back into that realm. You know what I mean? I um, I feel like I followed in the footsteps of, I say, academics finding a way of becoming hated through YouTube, but getting my foot in the door at the same time. And now that I've done that, I'd like to follow in the footsteps of others, even yourself, and establish myself in a different way uh, within hip hop. 
and just bring some new things to the table, shed light on some things that I feel I can bring forth, like the Florida culture, the prison culture, bringing on a lot of people whose stories haven't been heard. And I think that's the direction that I want to take on uh, my channel. I want to get away from the snitching shit and, you know what I mean? Well, if you want my advice, and uh, when it comes to this hip hop interview, YouTube shit, I'm the OG in this. Not because of, I feel I'm better than anyone else. I've just been doing it longer than everyone else. You know, in terms of a continuous interview channel on YouTube that focuses in the hip hop space, there's nobody that's been consistently doing it as long as I have. So if you were to ask for my advice, which I'm going to just throw out here right now. When you look at all of the successful podcasts and interview platforms that came after me, uh, they have two things in common. Number one is consistency. We drop around 10 clips a day, every day, 365 days a year. We've been doing this, you know, it started with just one clip a day but it was every day, at least one clip for fi now 16 years. So number one, you need the consistency. Right. You need to have people do a lot of interviews, chop them up if you have to, but drop content. If you could drop content seven days a week, that's always going to win over some of the drops uh, an interview once a week or once a month or whatever else. That's the first part. The second part is the strength of the guests that you bring in. You haven't really seen any podcasts that have blown up that just have the podcast host and one of his, you know, one or two of his friends talking about current events right. every, every day. Even Joe Budden, you know, regardless of our differences, yeah, like some of his shows are just him, but when you look at the stuff that reacts with him, it's like a Nicki Minaj or Umar Johnson or something like that coming in. Yeah. You know, when you look at drink champs, it's all based on the level of guests that they have. Gillian Wallow, they get big guests. You know, Vlad TV gets certain types of guests. Academics gets big guests. No Jumper get, get big guests in their own genre. You know, you know what I'm saying? So it really comes down to that. If you get big guests and consistency, you will almost guarantee growth over time. That's my advice. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? This is why I feel like the podcast, like Carisha, please, everyone gets a little annoyed when she wins awards because it's like you, you do an interview once every three months. Yeah, it's not earned. It's not It's not earned. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we're all out here grinding, like, you know, four or five interviews a week, like year after year after year. But ultimately, man, you're competing against the whole world right now. I feel like more people do interviews now than... Damn, I mean, I feel like it's, it's like the, the, the number one new job out there. You know, nah, every... definitely. And I, I feel like, you know, the third thing that creates success is being you. And yeah. if there's something about you yeah. that people like, and I mean, if I was able to pull off a million subscribers in what, under five years, mm -hmm. then I must have something. So I'm hoping to... Oh, uh, yeah take it as far as I can. Yeah, you know, no, absolutely. And I, I remember when I was a, a guest on the Danza Project, that's what I told them also. I said that when you look at all the the biggest podcasts, the the, the guys who are in charge of these podcasts, you know, the, the main personality, they've leaned into who they are. They've owned completely their persona, you know, the radio guys that are trying to be friends with everyone, that don't ask the tough questions, that try to keep everyone happy so they can still get invited to the parties and, you know, everything else like that. You don't hear very much of them, even, you know, like, for example, like the Sways. Like the Sway, I think, is an example of the old way of doing things. Yes, he gets a lot of big guests, but he doesn't really ask them very tough questions so the interviews don't go anywhere. Yeah. You know, but like you look at, for example, me, I'm known for asking the quote unquote police questions, you know, and, and that's never stopped. Yeah. I'm going to ask the tough questions. You know, if Keefe D wants to write a book about Tupac's murder, I'm going to talk to him about Tupac's murder. Yeah, hell yeah. You know, 
academics. He's the guy that's willing to beef with anyone. He'll respond to whoever and he'll go all the way and he'll go crazy and whatever else. Um, Adam, he's the porn guy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he does sex tapes with his wife and another guy yep. together. <laughs> you know what I mean? He'll keep pushing that envelope. I don't know what's next. Trans, midgets, uh, I, I don't know. Like there's, <laughs> you, I don't know how much further you can take it, Adam, but I'm sure you're trying to, you know, He's brainstorm it, it right now. Yeah. You know, um, Nori, Nori's the rapper guy, you know, the rapper that everyone loves and he's got the relationships with a lot of the big stars and they've done work together and he's got the history. Everyone got their thing that they lean into, that they don't try to pussyfoot around. So, you know, by you leaning into your personality, getting strong guests and being consistent, you know, you'll get to two, three, four, five million subscribers within a reasonable amount of time. You know, I'm at 5.7. Sometime in 2024, I'll hit six. Um, you know, I would like to get to 10. I don't know when that's going to happen. Yeah. You know, the, 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 I, the, the annoying part is that like YouTube will give you a plaque for a million subscribers. And then the next plaque is at 10 million. Yeah, that's a big leap. And that's a big leap. Yo, that's that diamond plaque, you know? That's, that's... The diamond plaque. Like, I don't know if I'll ever... Yeah, I mean, because I get about, I mean, about a thousand new subscribers a day. So, yeah, I mean, we're talking about a third of a million a year. If I'm close to six now, yeah, it's going to take me another 12 years <laughs> to get that plaque. I mean, that, that's a long time. It's hard work. It's hard work, man. But listen, I appreciate you coming back. Definitely. Uh, congrats on, on, you know, doing your thing and standing by your principles and, and putting that information out there. And I'm hoping that even if you start doing interviews, you'll still have this part of, of your, of your YouTube channel. Cause I think that you've actually built uh, a very unique following. Cause it's not like you're the only person that's ever done this before, but I feel like you've done it better than everyone else. I appreciate that. You know, I mean, I feel like you've gone to more detail and uh, more transparency than anyone else to the point where you'll even tell people, Hey, Here's how you look this up yourself if you don't believe me. And, uh, you know, between your personality and your background and everything else like that, where you are, I don't think it's an accident. And, uh, you know, appreciate you coming in this time. And, you know, we'll have you back soon enough. And if you want to do the thing with Whack, I'm going to hit him up and see if we can make it happen. <laughs> Definitely. That's what it is, man. 1090 Jake. Till next time. Peace.